to welcome you to the city of Mount Vernon. My name is Jill Boudreau, I'm the mayor of Mount Vernon, and we're just really, really thrilled to have you all here this morning. We're very proud to welcome 33 different organizations or agencies. We have seven cities represented, uh, city, county, state, and federal electeds are represented, so I just wanted to acknowledge my gratitude. On your table, or, when, or sorry, when you came in, there was a program, so on the back you'll find out um, really who's here and who's listening to conversations. Um, before we move forward, though, I do want to um, acknowledge um, the electeds or representatives of them in the room today. I'm not going to call out names because you know I'm going to forget someone. But if you represent a federal um, elected, if you could go ahead and scan and be acknowledged, please. I know Anne is here from Senator Murray's office, so thank you for uh, Senator Murray's office being here. We have our state electeds from the um, 39th, the 40th, and the 10th. If you're one of those electeds, if you might, might stand, I know Alex Graham was here, so thank you so much. If you're an elected official from Skagit County, whether it be commissioner or sheriff or uh, court, I know that Tom's not going to stand, but our sheriff is here, so thank you for being here. And then um, our cities. Anyone who's uh, representing cities, which is our peers, uh, please stand, because I'm so grateful you spent time today as well. So thank you so much. Um, it, it takes um, a commitment to be interested and be willing to learn new things and to think about um, hard subjects, especially something like a model of mental health care. So I'm glad that you're here to perhaps uh, challenge your own understanding, to uh, think about how the system works and be inspired in a movement to create a better system for our residents. Mount Vernon was one of uh, the first of five cities about six years ago that recognized the need for embedded social workers in our law enforcement. And so we're proud that we had Ms. Erin Von Femme, who joined our team, who not only took our um, culture of compassion to another level, but she brought ideas forward. So we're grateful that she's here today and has helped us move forward in this um, addressing our public. Not only did we embed a social worker, we also passed uh, zoning that allowed permanent supported housing. So as you drove here to McIntyre Hall today, um, you may have noticed construction on College Way just a few blocks away. That's Martha's Place. A permanent supported housing project, a Catholic housing services that will support 70 chronically homeless individuals. So we're thrilled to be able to say that we've done that. But why did we even get here? So I wanted to provide just a little bit of context. We started analyzing our calls to service and to law enforcement. And in 2020, we had about 5,900 calls for service, which represents 27% of the overall demand to our police department. Those calls for service that we can attribute to mental health or substance um, addiction, um, were, it were very stark. It's a significant portion of demand on our services. In further analyzing that data, we saw that about 46 individuals uh, were attributed to those thousands of calls. And shockingly, 82% were not enrolled in services with one of Skagit County's primary health care service providers, and many did not be uh, or qualify for services. 82%. When we looked at our fire and EMS services, about 4,500 of those EMS, uh, EMS calls per year, but 886 we felt were related to substance abuse or mental health, and 50% did not require ambulance there could be another way to deliver services and help those individuals without the EMS system. I'm not going to read through all these, but in Aaron's work and in all of our work, we ran into bottlenecks and barriers navigating a complex space, and we know that we can do better. We've demonstrated success by thinking differently. On the left, you'll see an individual that Aaron worked with. Uh, helped um, this individual after they were evicted in 2019, went through and assisted in untreated health issues, three different Washington IDs, spend down to get Medicaid, help the person get enrolled in services, and in 2021, uh, individual was housed in an apartment. The individual on the right in the middle is named Julie. She would call into 911 more than one or two times per day 
and if uh, incentivizing her with a cup of coffee 30 minutes of time eliminated her calls for service. The demonstrated success that we've had so far is the individual uh, Ms. Doe had 119 police contacts in 2020 and in 2021 we went to 10. So we know that there's a better way to do things. How did we do it? We're going to talk a little lunch after you listen to Dr. Reagan. So I hope you'll stick around to hear about our integrated outreach services. Despite our best efforts, we really felt we couldn't help but feeling that we were failing the public. I'm going to read you an actual conversation that helps illustrate this point. This is a provider. You missed too many appointments, so now you have to do the walk-in appointments. You've been transferred to Jay, client. I don't know Jay. I like Tracy. Why can't I have Tracy? Provider, you've been transferred to Jay, or you could come during walk-in hours and see Jeff. Client, if Jeff is the guy who was getting his master's while working there, I don't want to see him. Provider, well, you can see Jay twice before September 20, or your case will be closed. Client, I will, I will. Please don't close my case. I will get over there even if I have to sleep on the steps. Provider, you'll have to call Monday, September 11, to see when Jay's available that week. He works Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Client, now how do I get more meds? I'm out. Provider, after you say, see Jay once, I'll schedule an appointment with Monica, but if you don't make it with Jeff, you can't see her. <laughs> We cannot be afraid to examine different ways to serve our community. We don't acknowledge what is broken. We can't move to better without it. I am encouraged though, and here's why. That's why I invited you here today. March 2022, just a few months ago, the Skagit County City Mayors and Skagit County Commissioners issued a public statement in which we committed to join forces and align our efforts to work toward a healthy and thriving community. It has become clear to the signatories to this call to action that the current conditions cannot continue. We believe that it is in our collective interest to join forces now to re-examine current systems of care and pursue all available avenues to render those systems more effective. Thrilled to have Dr. Reagans here today. He has influenced our employees way before I think he even knew it. And that is through Aaron, who worked with him for over 20 years in California. And we're inviting him to the podium today. Dr. Reagans was the medical director for 27 years at the Mental Health America Village in Long Beach, California. An award-winning model of recovery-based mental health services before uh, leaving to become the only campus psychiatrist at Cal State University Long Beach in 2017. He is one of the true pioneers and leaders of person-centered, recovery-based psychiatry. Many of his writings are posted online at markreagans.com, including his short book, A Road to Recovery. Over the years, Dr. Mark has won a number of awards, including the American Psychiatric Association's Arnold von Van American Award in Psychiatric Rehabilitation, the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Association's John Beard Award for his outstanding lifetime contribution to psychiatric rehabilitation, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI's California's Recovery Practitioner of the Year, and selected as a distinguished fellow by the American Psych Psychiatric Association. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Reagan. You can, now you can hear me, right? You can tell if somebody's important by, uh, you know, for one thing, did they come from far away? And for another thing, did they mess with the technology and they seem to have no idea what they're doing? And really, what's really good is if you have a British accent, that, that would make you really, so I got, I got two of the three, so I'm okay. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you all for having me um, here today. Um, 
I'm here to spend some time messing with you about looking at how things be different. Oh, first, I'm not care about this stupid math. Um, it's, I'm going to have to do this a hundred times because it keeps fogging my glasses. So I was debating whether to wear this or not. And I'm a little bit older, and I have had a heart attack, so I was worried a little bit that. But mostly, I have a one-year-old grandson, and his dad is an ER doctor who has a really fancy PCR test you can get like in 20 minutes. And I only get to visit him if I test negative. Similarly, I have a vacation plan in a couple of weeks. My wife said, you better not come out of COVID and ruin our vacation. <laughs> so I'm going to mess with the mask. Um, uh, hopefully it doesn't get too much in the way. So I'm going to try to talk about the ways we got here a little bit and something to give you a big overview about recovery. What is different about this? Because recovery is kind of a vague word. What are we meaning about this? What's it about? And then hopefully, if I manage to get through nine hours of slides, through to the things about specifically what would some practical tools show. This really is a real thing. It's been fleshed out. It's not just waving hands around. So, so here's where we all start. The story you see in every newspaper article everywhere is they closed the state mental hospitals. They didn't put enough money into the community. You didn't get community mental health going. We gave them too many rights, so people refuse treatment even when they need it. And that's made the giant mess. That's why we got people in jail harassing our policemen, our firemen, and, and on the streets. And what we need is to rebuild some hospitals, put money actually in those community clinics, and decrease people's rights, and then we'll be able to do it. This is a story we've all heard over and over again for fit my entire career now. The story starts like in 1960 something. But is it actually true? This next slide is, now it's a little blurry, I'll admit, and I'm going to have to use a pointer here, because I stole it from Tom Insel's new book. So I'll give him a shout out just in return for stealing his book. I did that write an email asking for permission. He hasn't answered yet. But the, the, Tom Insel was the head of the NIMH, which is the main federal funding for research for like 2002 to 2015 or something. The main, he spent billions of dollars on scientific research. And his question is, you know, we did all this research, learned all this stuff about a brain. Why is people still struggling? It seems worse than ever. What's going on here? Did they do find out good stuff about cancer and we do better? Why are we doing worse here? And bizarrely enough, the point of his book, and I'll show you his quote in a little bit, is, you know, mental illnesses are different than cancer and infectious diseases. We need a recovery-based approach, which is really remarkable coming from the guy who does all this basic science research up and Decius' conclusion. But he begins his book in exactly the same place everyone begins, with this story of deinstitutionalization. He shows this graph to prove this line. Let's see if I can make this work. Let's see, it's this one. Does this work? Yeah, this line is the people leaving the hospitals. This line is people going into prison. See, all the people left the hospitals and then went to prison. I first saw this graph like 10 years ago at a conference with one of my old supervisors who was the head of the APA showing it. And I said, wait a minute, can we go back to that graph for a minute? He says, why? What's wrong? It shows it. I said, well, shouldn't the lines like cross in the middle somehow? How come they're both low here? How does it happen that you let people out of the hospital and they do fine? And then 20 years later, they start showing up in the jails. And that goes up and up and up even when we're not letting anybody out. There's no hospitals to let people out of at all anymore. Isn't this graph at the wrong time? And then a few years later, somebody else said, you know these people in the hospital over here? The majority of them were white women. You know these people on this side who are in prison? Anybody but think the majority of them are white women? These aren't even the same people. You don't let white women out of a hospital and end up with black men and Hispanic men in jails as a result. What the hell? And when I saw this, I noticed one other thing on this graph when I saw it in the book and actually look at it carefully, which is a little blurry to see that these two sides, the scales are different. This is the one that goes from zero to 500. This is beds for state hospital beds per thousand population, or 100 or what, how many? This is the number of jail and prison beds. This is, goes up to 2,500. 
So if we made this graph on the same scale as this one, this high point here would be about here. And it would go down like this. In fact, these lines do cross way back here. But this is a teeny, teeny hill. There's five times as many people here as there were ever over this side. This graph that's been proven, we all know it's in every newspaper. People left the state hospitals, ended up in the jails. In my opinion, proves the exact opposite. The timing isn't right. The people aren't the same people. And the numbers don't come close to being the same. So what's actually going on here? Did something else happen starting in like 1980? Remember, go back to the graph. What, this, here in 80 is when it starts going up like crazy. It's leveled off a bit here in this last 20 years. But what happened in here? What has started happening in 1980? And a few things happened that I know of. One, for instance, there used to be giant housing projects. But then when I went to training, it was in St. Louis, across the street from our mental hospital, it was a giant housing project. A terrible, terrible place. The kids would get destroyed, lots of crime going on. The police wouldn't even go in there. The Hell's Angels were policing it. And there was corruption and murders and all kinds. That's terrible. And then IDA, Regan is president, said we're going to stop that and do HUD vouchers and stuff. We know these vouchers instead. What they rarely mention is they removed 90% of the money out of the system when they did that. And it's been going down ever since. I'd love to see a graph that was the number of people in the projects going down against the number of people in prison. And by the way, don't the people in prison look a lot more like the people in the projects than they look like white women? We took away the housing. Second thing happened, we've been lowering welfare ever since. The amount you get to support, you used to be able to support a family with the welfare. You had two kids or three kids, it was enough to support your family. To give you an example of this, how this one deteriorates. In Long Beach, when we started in 1990, Social Security disability was $630 a month there. It's more in California than here, but $630 a month. The worst crummiest single apartment in a gang-ridden neighborhood was about three or three and a quarter. So we tell people, all right, we got you SSI. If you don't spend it for rent in the next few months, we're going to become your payee and make you get a place, make you spend the rent, then 200 bucks a month on food, and the last 100 you can spend on whatever you want, even if it's crack or whatever. Fast forward to when I left five years ago, SSI has gone up. It's 940 now. The cheapest, crummiest rundown apartment in Long Beach is now $1,300. We can no longer say, well, you better get a place or we'll get it for you, it's upside down. Welfare is no of any kind no longer pays the rent anywhere. And that just isn't because it's Los Angeles. It's not doesn't cover any place, any place. And the third thing was the war on drugs. Happened starting in the 80s. The, so, why is this important? Because if we think the problem is closing the state hospitals, then we think the answer is rebuilding the state hospitals, putting more in community mental health, and decreasing people's rights. That's the solution, because that was the problem. But if the problem was actually eliminating public housing, decreasing welfare support payments, and doing a war on drugs, I'm not sure building a few state hospitals and giving more people involuntary meds is going to impact your problem very much. I mean, she had some weird stats like 50% are, or don't even mental illnesses that people are calling her. So why, how would this be true? Why would this make sense? Oops, why did I go the wrong way? Oh, I went the wrong way before. I, you didn't get to see this slide along the way. That was my three points. <laughs> Risk factors. We pretty much know that the more terrible things happen to you, the more likely you are to have mental symptoms and be worse and worse. Even for people there who they weren't diagnosed with something, I bet they had a bunch of terrible things happen to them. The more terrible things, the more bad things happen. And this isn't just for poor minority people. They did a study called the ACEs study with middle-class white people who are on Kaiser Insurance in San Diego. And they said, so how many of you had a parent who died, domestic violence, a parent with substance abuse or mental health, some kind of other serious someone, violence in your family, something like this. And if you had a lot of these things, you had really bad things happen to you. And if you did, had very few, you did quite well. And by the way, this was a lifelong effect. It wasn't just you didn't graduate from high school, ended up in jail. 
you ended up using substances, you end up with medical problems, you end up with heart disease. This predicted heart disease better than weight predicted heart disease. And you died early. Terrible things happening in childhood has a big impact on what happens to you going on. And there in the discussion, I was in a, com I was in a conference once with a man named Carl Bell. He died a few years ago. He wasn't very old, but he died a few years ago. This is a incredibly loud, bright, dynamic black psychiatrist wearing a cow black cowboy hat who's friends with like Obama and Oprah and people like this. And he's like, you know, kicking and taking names. And he says, you know that business about that curve that says the more bad things happen, the more mental illness symptoms you get? He says, that's only true in the absence of protective factors. I'm like, oh yeah? And when you have protective factors, the line is almost flat. Now I'm paying attention, so all right, what are protective factors? The first five are his. You got enough money to make it through the month and a little extra for emergencies. So like if your transmission goes out and you don't have $300 to fix it, you don't like lose your job and then your apartment and your kids are taken away and your whole life goes to You have some reasonably safer, secure place to live. Then it'd be perfect to some place. You have some kind of family. It can be a dysfunctional, messed up family. We all have that. Just a, some kind of family. Who cares about you, sort of. Some other adult protective shield, you know, some teacher or coach or minister, or something like this who is around to help you out. And some identity besides you're a bad kid or a sick kid or a messed up kid. I'm the smart one. I'm the athlete. I'm the artist. I'm the something. By the way, when I look at the kids I see now in college, and I work at a college that comes from a very poor neighborhood, the difference between them and, the, and their brothers and sisters who grew up in the same places is that last one. They believed that they were something besides a bad kid or a messed up mentally ill kid. I was always going to do this. I'm the one who's supposed to go to college and take care of my family and blah, blah, blah. It's amazing the pressure on these kids, but all right. I've since added two more to the list for adults because he only did kids. One is, it seems to me, spiritual beliefs and practices are somewhat protective. People are connected to our church or believe in God and things will work out as a purpose and stuff. That seems to help you make it through tough times, regardless of which religion that is. It seems to help. And the one is, being more psychologically healthy and stronger is better. <laughs> it helps you make through things. There are psychological factors. This huge paper is written about this. But psychological things make you better. Why am I telling you all this? Because look back at those things they did at the beginning of the 80s. They systematically destroyed all the protective factors, especially the kids, but also the adults. And the outcome was that we see lots of people in huge distress ended up on the streets and all these problems. Those risk factors turned into problems because we got rid of the protective factors. And if you conceptualize it that way instead, if you say, our problem is when we closed the mental hospitals, our problem is we destroyed all the protective factors. And by the way, it isn't all the government's fault. Families that have been deteriorating dramatically since the 80s as well, you know, broken families and divorce rates and stuff like this as well. And families tend to be the glue for people. Then you'd say our solutions are not just to rebuild mental hospitals and clinics, it's to rebuild protective factors. How do we make sure people have enough money to make it through and for emergencies, a place, a place to live, reconnect them to their families, have other adults in the community that look out for them and they're connected to, other roles besides being a messed up adult, connection with some spiritual stuff and some ability to build your psychological strengths maybe as a kid along the way you're learning through suffering. By the way, now it's not appearing that whole thing needs to be funded by the mental health system and wait, those guys are the ones who will send them over there and they need to fix it. That's like all of us working together, that, this job now. This is a community failure rather than a mental health failure. All right, let me stop for a minute there. This thing, because there's this old Zen thing that this, the, the, like, the student came and wanted to be taught by the Zen master. And, not that I'm a Zen master, but I want to be taught by the Zen master. And like he's got this tough tea, and the Zen master keeps pouring more tea in and keeps overflowing in birds. And he says, What are you doing? He says, Well, you're not going to learn anything new until you get rid of what's already in your cup. So the this 
first set of slides is trying to get ready, rid of what's in your cup. To think for a minute is that story you've heard repeated over and over again. By the way, those of you who are from your representative's office, I'm my wife actually is close friends with our state representative. I was telling him this about a month ago. He says, what? Everybody knows it's true that you'd close this. Are you the only one that believes this, or is, someone, is this a widely held belief? I said, mostly just me, and so then he ignored me and thought I was wrong. I'm going to send him this PowerPoint. <laughs> or maybe the tape. I don't know. All right. By the way, what did happen to those people they let out of the mental hospital? Those white women, what happened to them? Here's a study, 1987. Vermont was one of the first places to close their mental hospital. Thorazine came out in the early 60s. Some of the patients responded to it. The governor said, great, let's close the whole hospital and give them money in the community. The doctor says, no, 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 not everyone responds to the Thorazine. I got a bunch of people who are not responding. You can't let them out. The governor said, no, no, we'll let them out. And I'll give you a little money for the community. It'll be fine. The doctor said, no, no, don't let them out. They let them out. This set of people, it's like 200 people, are the people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia even going back looking at the charts, making sure it's today's diagnostic standards, who did not respond to Thorazine or meds, who the, who the doctors didn't want to let out. That's who this set is. Not like your ideal set of people. And she drives around in her van. This is Courtney Harding is like a nurse at Yale and with like her family dragging along. And it must be easier to find people in Connecticut than it is in Los Angeles because she finds like 92% of them. And she gets her stories 20 or 30 years later. And these are the outcomes. 83% didn't end up in a hospital. They've got friends. Half of them are employed of that set. They can meet their basic needs. They have a full life. Half of them have slight or no impairment at all. She made a little definition of recovery. She said two-thirds of those people recovered. That's what happened to the, that one little bump. Two-thirds of them, 20 years later, were recovered, even with mediocre services in Vermont. By the way, she did this again in, in Maine, where they did no services, and only half of people recovered there. It does matter what the community is doing. But this study is done in 1987, before we took away all the protective factors. We're likely doing worse now, not because our treatment is worse than it was in the 70s. And she said, by the way, we know this later, she said, um, this wasn't because they took their meds perfectly or something. They didn't. Or they went to their appointments perfectly. That's just what happens over years if there's reasonable protective factors in community and families to be around. They're doing so badly because of lack of connectedness, not because of lack of treatment. All right. I don't have these memorized from this part. So some things that we believe or see that distort how we see things are important. One is... We don't spend our time with the people doing best. I love that the mayor started with, here's two success stories. Nobody ever starts with two success stories. How many in your, in your meetings go, all right, so what successful thing happened this week that we can talk about in our meeting? I don't care what your job is, you don't start like that. You start out with, who's the pain in the ass that's called 40 times in the last week? The same person we talked about last week and the week before. And you get yourself all bummed out and think everybody does crap because you spend all your time with the people doing really badly. We get this distortion that everyone's doing badly because those are the people we see. Courtney, the lady who did that research, said she was, by the way, thrown, a, thrown out of grand rounds and medical establishments everywhere because no one could believe that was true. It's just not possible. People with schizophrenia or did sisters, I didn't recover. That didn't happen. Or in my mother's words, I'll see it when I believe it. Are what we, when we believe things like we experience can be distorted. She called this a clinician's illusion because we spend our time doing, and I'm sure there's a policeman's illusion in the same way. Second thing that happens weird is there's a difference between helping homeless people and helping the problem of homelessness. 
I'm actually connected to Steve Lopez, who wrote this fellow from the LA Times. He wrote all this stuff about homelessness and stuff. And he called a few months ago because they're feeling desperate in Hollywood and it's going badly and the homelessness are just increasing terribly. And we've been working at it for 30 years. Why is it worse than ever? What's happening here? They go off to Trieste, Italy, trying to find solutions. Italian accents are good besides just British. Go off to Trieste, Italy, looking for solutions. And he's like, oh, I'm so worn down. Is there any hope for this? I said, it depends which side of you're looking at. Here's some numbers from LA County from before the pandemic from the homeless counts, which are not perfectly accurate by any stretch. They had 50,000 home, we had 50,000 homeless people. This is quite a large number. 50,000 homeless people over that year. We have tons of homeless services. We got 25,000 of them housed. Half of them, we got off the streets of various things. And 30,000 new homeless people appeared. 20,000 were from our own county and 10,000 were donated from other places. And at the end of the year, that leaves us 55,000 homeless people. If you're on the side, how do I fix homelessness? This looks like you're bailing a leaking raft. You're just sinking and sinking and sinking and it feels hopeless. If you're on the other side, if you were one of those 25,000 people who actually got off the street, this is not hopeless at all. And even some of the 25,000 who didn't get off the street, Having someone with them helping and not being on the streets alone in these connections, that can be very valuable too. The only outcome isn't getting off the streets. There's other positive things we do too. We can be hopeful for any our ability to help any given person while the overall social problems remain. We're not going to, it's very hard to fix the world. So those of you who are like me, clinicians who've gotten to this because you want to help people we're much more likely to feel satisfied with our job because we help people than you all who want to make the world a better place and are looking at why things are deteriorating socially with all those terrible problems that I don't know the solution to. But even this one has a clinician's bias to it. Our program was doing better than 50%. When we had things going better, we were doing 70% getting off the streets, you'll see in a minute. And I realized I spent all my time thinking about the 30% who didn't. I eventually figured out that I would have to be running a 92% success rate in order to feel good about the work I was doing that was positive. We have a way of focusing on just the negatives. The other thing, because we notice the people, are, people, you know, when someone comes back, they come back because they failed, not because they don't come back and tell you I did really good. Occasionally someone does, but not that often. Treasure it when they do, by the way. But you see where this doesn't work, you see the, the failures. We used to call this as the St. Elsewhere, so I was old enough to remember the St. Elsewhere TV show. People came from these hospitals, St. Elsewhere with those problems as though everybody fails there because you only see the failures. And the last one is a huge problem from a political point of view. If you're doing any kind of service that is at all helpful, that people like, people will show up to it. Some of the people just from down the streets and around, some from a little further, if you get more famous from even further, but people will show up. And the guys doing crappy work over there, less homeless people will show up. And the neighbors will like them better than you. I'm now trying to help. There's a, a clubhouse program in Santa Ana. This is Orange County is a, south of LA County. It's a wealthy, mostly white area, but one of the cities in it is Santa Ana, which is a poor Hispanic neighborhood. There's lots of homelessness, and it tends to be mostly in Santa Ana. So they put a homeless drop-in center run by a, another MHA program, and it does quite well, and people come there. And the city of Santa Ana is suing to get rid of it, because look at all the homeless people scattered, standing around this program. This is going to be, any time you do something that's helpful, it's going to look like you're making the problem worse, which is a, a giant political problem. One of my, my best supervisor in, med, in residency was Dr. Richard Lamb. You do not know him, likely, but you do know his quote because it's so brilliant, the one on the top there. You've all heard this quote, right? LA County Jail is the largest mental hospital in the whole country. Let me tell you a little backstory about this one again. So Richard Lamb, he just died last year at age like 90 something. He was a 
biological psychiatrist in the era when they were first breaking loose from the psychoanalysts. He hated the psychoanalysts. Although he, in his supervision session, he had this little pipe he messed with, like you're out of a New Yorker cartoon. But he had the psychoanalyst. He was with the DSM and diagnosis. He had begun his career as a psych tech in the old psych hospitals with the lobotomies and with the easy electric shock therapy and all the horrors. And yet, as he, they close him, he be in the community. He was one of those who, who yearned for those days of asylum, some way to take care of these people, even though he'd seen the abuses firsthand. It's, it's people who can't take care of themselves, these problems, they don't come to their appointments. He liked, loved the idea of asylum. He did not believe in recovery at all. He didn't think it was schizophrenia ever recovered. Of course, they didn't in the state hospital. That was what he saw, that's what he believed. So the, he did this hugely courageous thing. He said, I think that the people with schizophrenia we let out aren't actually in our clinics. They're actually in our jail someplace or someplace else. Let's see who's in there. Terrific thing to do. He walks in there, but he's got the glasses on of a biological psychiatrist who doesn't believe in recovery, um, who thinks asylum is good. And what does he see? He sees the largest mental institute in the country. He sees it through those glasses. And it's such a compelling quote, he talked the rest of us into it. Imagine for a minute he had different glasses, that it was a different person who had this courage who did this. What if he was someone who paid attention to childhood trauma, like those ACEs people, or Carl Bell had walked in there? Or if he paid it was from foster care, looking for what happens to people who graduate out of foster care. He would have said, this is a display case of the outcomes of childhood trauma and neglect in foster care, the largest one in the country. What if he would have walked in there talking about, think, and he was a teacher, he would have said, you know, the average educational level here is the third grade reading level, and the thing that most predicts being reoffended after parole from prison is illiteracy. He said, this is a failure of our reading at nine program, which actually, to be fair, LA County made a giant reading at nine program without a fancy quote. What if he was someone who saw things through the angle of drug abuse as our problem and a war of drugs? He was saying 80% of all the men and 90% of the women in jail test positive for drugs and alcohol when they are arrested. I don't know if this means you only get caught if you're drunk or high, or those people commit a lot of crimes, but, or if you can make bail if you're not drunk or high or something, you get out that way. What if he was someone who was... My housing thing. These are the people who used to live in the projects. If you actually ask them, did you, did you grow up in the projects? Did your family used to live in the projects? What if he looked through the lens of racism? What would he have seen? We, his quote there is so spectacular, we assume the world is just the ones he saw through his glasses and no other one. And we don't look at any of these other perspectives or solutions, and the medical model doesn't include any of them. All right, so our program at MHA. We got a, so there's a guy who's a um, young man. He's at Harvard. He gets schizophrenia, gets psychotic. The local programs act about like her quotes were there. They say, oh, he can't sit still in the day treatment. He can't be here. The residential program throws him out at two in the morning with no place to go. He's too low function to be in our mental health programs. His dad is like, isn't that what you're supposed to be helping? What you're like, I had a supervisor used to say, these people would be so much easier to treat if they didn't have what was wrong with them. The, so his dad turns out to be a documentary filmmaker who goes around making trouble. So he goes all the way up to like the tenant government's office, finds somebody who like has a brother with schizophrenia to help him out. Says, we've got to fight these terrible things. They're doing horrible things. They don't take care of my son reasonably at all. And then reasonably, the lieutenant governor says, you know, I don't think anybody is sitting up late at night trying to figure out how to make a terrible mental health system. I'm not going to spend a bunch of money investigating what's wrong with things. If you want to do so, what's right with things or how we can do better, I'll pay attention to that. But to just do another criticism, I'm not that interested. Even though he's a muckraking, angry filmmaker, he said, okay, I'll do it. They go wandering around the country, 
and say, you know, there's a bunch of stuff out there that nobody's doing. They found these things. I'll go through them one at a time. Act teams. This idea of this one was when they let people out of the state hospitals, they didn't show up to their appointments at the clinics. The clinics actually weren't even made for people with serious mental illnesses. They are made for community mental health interests. They didn't show up at their clinics, and they landed back in the hospital. And this was costing money. They said, this is a giant failure. So they said, well, what if we have, what if we, like, pretend we're a hospital without walls? We've got the same staff here as we used to have. Why don't we have the staff go out and find them and bring the thing, make sure they all take their meds? When they did this, the recidivism went down from 70% to 30%. Once they said, it's not, nothing is 100%, by the way. <laughs> nothing works for everybody. We're down to 30%. That saved a bunch of money, at least in Madison, Wisconsin, this worked quite well, and it spread all over the world. Now, most of your trained psychologists and psychiatrists and nurses and stuff don't like driving people around and going to pick them up and do things. They said, can we have some like low life or lower paid people who don't have a professional degree to do this, to be case managers and go around and do these things for us instead, because that's below my uh, what I've been trained to do. I like doing therapy and handing out pills. So they added a whole bunch of, of paraprofessional and case managers to this. Some other people said, you know, everything on the team works fine, but the minute you have to go to some other program for something else, it falls apart. What if we put someone on the team that does employment? Suddenly your employment outcomes go from 20% to 70%. What if we put someone on the team that does housing? Suddenly your housing goes from you don't 80% losing their HUD certificate to only 20% losing their HUD certificate. What if you put in someone that does substance abuse? What if you tell someone does primary medical care? Whatever you put integrated in the team, you get the outcomes of them. Whenever you leave them programs scattered all over the place, it doesn't work. That's one thing we were doing, and nobody was funding it like this, because each of these things have separate funding sources. Second thing was a clubhouse. This was from New York in the state hospital. They let out some people who were got out in the New York, and they were lonely. Turns out loneliness is a significant problem. We should have all learned that in the last two years, if nothing else, after this pandemic. So they were meeting on the steps of the New York uh, library, that one with the big lions that, you know, was like in Ghostbusters. The, so they're like meeting on the steps out there, and they're meeting, and getting along like this. And they find someone, it's like some, some do-getter donates money, and they get a place called Fountain House, and they can meet over there. And they start spending time over there as a place they are welcome to come. It isn't, when's your appointment, when's your time? You can't hang out here. This is the wrong time. No, no, you're welcome. Come on here. In fact, this place doesn't run without you. Would you like a job so you feel needed instead of rejected? Won't pay you very much. Hey, hey you, want, you want to be the one who is a receptionist? You want to answer the phones? You want to make the lunches? You want to be the janitor? You want to put up the artwork on the place? We'll all do it for each other. We'll feel welcome here. We'll feel useful where no one else wants us. This is really cool. Then they said, you know, when you have physical disabilities, this is Boston University, says when you have physical disabilities, we don't wait till your broken leg is fixed if you're in a wheelchair forever to help you get a job or when you're blind till your eyesight comes back. We don't tell Helen Keller when you don't have any symptoms, you can work. Maybe we could do that with psychiatric things. How about even if you're hearing voices, even if you're manic, even if you're depressed or panic attack, can we help you get adaptations to get a job? And maybe, well, that's the part of employment. Can someone help you with the adaptations and being with their on the job, do, learning by doing? And they made up support of all kinds of stuff, support of education, support of housing, support of employment, support of medical care. All these things can you do it with, even though you still have symptoms, can you do things in life? And they said, how about drug abuse? The treatment I was taught in residency in the 80s for drug people who come with drug addiction is come back when you're ready to be clean and sober. Not going to give you any meds. It'll interact badly with your, uh, with your drugs, and I'm not going to take the risk of that, and there's no point doing a therapy with you because you're not paying attention because you're drunk anyway, and I'm not going to waste my time. You've got to be clean and sober first. By the way, the, the drug rehab program says come back when you don't have any mental symptoms, and those are stabilized first. So they actually ended up all at the ER instead, instead of anyone's clinic or anyone's program. They ended up in the hospitals and jails and the ER and stuff, these people with drug addiction and a bunch of mental problems. 
said, well, there is a better way for that too. Can we make a four-step program? This is invented in the 80s. Although, frankly, I just did a presentation about this at Rutgers for, for SAMHSA, and, there, and there, I got the little chat things where it said, oh, thank you for your innovative approach. Innovative approach. It was made up in the late 80s. I learned it in 91. But yes, it still feels like an innovative that you've got some people who are using and not talking about it at all and will lie about it and don't want to stop. They need engagement. Some people who are engaged and paying attention, but they don't feel ready to stop it yet, and you're trying to persuade them into it. Some people are in active treatment who do want to go to programs to get better. And some people you're trying to sustain doing better so they don't relapse when they get out of the program. All these things were laying around, and no one was doing them. By the way, how many of these do you have in these active forums going on right now? This is still sort of the case 30 years later. One more that was laying around is the consumer movement. They call themselves the survivor movement. These people were people who were really pissed at us. They didn't mean they survived schizophrenia. They didn't survive us. These people were really upset about how they were treated in the state hospitals and locked up and traumatized. And they made projects like the cemetery project because we threw all their bones in the back and didn't mark them something called a suitcase project, because people came with their life in the suitcase and left it there and then to the hospital and left their whole life behind and they just issued things to the hospital and what lives were lost when they entered there. They told their stories of their own recoveries and their struggles and stuff and said, we did it despite you, not because of you. And they're pissed. And many of them started to try to take over and do things themselves, run consumer run programs, their own. just stay out of here, psychiatrists and stuff. We'll figure it out ourselves better than you. At least you won't, we won't be dehumanized and locked up and rejected and stuff. We'll take care of each other instead. Some of them were more collaborative and worked alongside of us as, as peer workers with us. Some got taken in by us and started acting more like professionals and lost all their anger and, and stuff and the special things they were bringing. It's not necessarily a good thing. Levels, but this consumer movement that they say, dude, by the way, today's stories of trauma are no longer containing those deinstitutionalization stories. You don't meet people who spent years in the state hospitals anymore. Today's stories of trauma are me and the guys in the back. One is that doctor only saw me for 15 minutes. I've had six different diagnoses. He drugged me up with three different pills. It made me terribly worse. It took me forever to get off of them. You're just pushing pills and you don't actually try to help anyone with anything real. You're just trying to drug me up to quiet me down. Or the policeman came by and handcuffed me and took me in the truck and took me over to the hospital or the Jail, and there was nothing wrong with this and argued there, and that's what they're um, feeling traumatized at. They're, once again, they're surviving me and you, not surviving their illness. The rest of you can get some splash over, but we get most of it. By the way, here's a number of jobs that people with experiences of mental illnesses can do. If you happen by some bizarre chance to have a shortage of professional mental health workers around, there's a bunch of dedicated people who want to give back from their own recoveries and use their own experiences. By the way, AA has been running this for free for 80 years. It's even recession-proof funding. These are all the things you can hire them to do. So the village, they said, great, do all those things. No one, well, how well would that work if you just do them all? And we did. We had an ACT team inside of a clubhouse using psychosocial with supportive services and the forced aid substance abuse and some people, consumers working alongside. I never had a coworker who had schizophrenia before. We did them all. And they had the research thing and how this compare to people in the normal system. How to compare? Awesome. Our outcomes were better than anybody that had them anywhere else on. These are some sample outcomes. 71 thing, and nothing worse 100%. 70% reductions in homelessness and jailings, 400% um, increase in, in employment. By, these, by the way, these people we took in, they're basically SSI level of impairment or more. That's who these people are that we took in. Um, two thirds were in substance abuse recovery. An auditor came by and said, I particularly love how when you wa someone walks in, there's a staff who's accessible. It isn't like I'm going to be on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, call this. No, there's some, if it's not your person, someone on the team who knows, someone you know you can talk to who's always accessible. Also, the other thing they said was, you take their dreams seriously. 
when they say, I want to go back to school, you actually start making plans to do that. I want an apartment, you actually make plans to start doing that. These outcomes go up and down over the 25 years, depending on whether there's a recession, a housing boom, no jobs, prices go up, different things happen, our funding changes. So they take out the hospital funding and then we can't control it anymore. We take out the, give them the employment money to voc rehab and then we can't get the same employment outcomes, you know. Yeah. So what does this have to do with recovery? I claimed I was gonna show you a better way of recovery. I just said, here's a bunch of things that everybody's not, that everybody is uh, not doing, and if you do it, it works better. Well, couldn't the medical model have done that? Couldn't they have done these things? Well, not really. The medical model only funds clinical services that treat illnesses done by clinical professionals. Not like clubhouses for if you're lonely. Not like someone driving you around the places in the community. You see, we try to make elaborate notes to get this, these sort of things funded, and they try to get it back at us, and before we know, we're spending three hours a day writing notes in this argument of whether that's a medical service or not. Also, clinical services tend to treat people like patients, not like coworkers. I'll give professional orders, I'm the doctor, you do what I say, and I'll test your compliance, and you'll get better that way. You don't tell me what we're supposed to be doing. What is wrong with you? The, also, we worry about, i got to have distant, professional distance. I'm not going to go out of my office and stuff. I'm not going to, like, eat something. I'm not going to eat lunch with someone with mental illness or, like, play pool with them or sweep the, the streets on a street cleaning thing alongside them or go to a housewarming party. That's not, that's not behavior becoming of a psychiatrist. You don't do like that. Well, if I only act like a doctor, they can only act like a patient. Small digression on that one. When I was in medical school, I got to go to a psychoanalytic place of, called Menninger's. And it was one of the last great psychoanalytic places. And it was in Topeka, Kansas. Now, I'm from L.A., so I didn't know it's a bad idea to go to Topeka, Kansas in January. <laughs> it is really cold and snowy there. This is on a beautiful campus. The people there are absurdly wealthy. They would come to their family meetings in like private jets. You stayed for 14 months there as in programs there. On a beautiful campus there, since they sold it to Texas, but it was in Kansas at the time. And they go for walks around this campus. The staff and the patients together in the snow. Put on my jacket and these boots. And the, the psychiatrist there, I used to see, think he was middle-aged and overweight, but he was probably substantially younger and thinner than I am today. But... <laughs> I was much younger and thinner than I am today. But anyway, he's wearing his suit and his tie and his patent leather shoes, and he's pretty full of himself, and he's quite good, actually. He knows all kinds of, he knows meds, he knows group therapy things, he knows psychodynamics, psychoanalysis, he knows all kinds. He's, he's fun. And we go walking outside the front door, and the psychiatrist slips on the ice and falls. And this guy who had been sitting around, this young man with catatonia, he would just sit in one spot like this, if you came up to him, I'd say a few words, but if you came back a few hours later, he'd not just be in the same seat, he'd be in the same position. He helps him up. And then starts helping him back around the path. You know, watch out for the ice here in the snow here. I walk back. You get back all the way to the front door, and the psychiatrist stops and pulls himself back together. And the matter with catatonia stops and pulls himself back together. If we can only be chronically knowing all the answers, no serious problems of our own, solve everything, take responsibility for everything, mental health professionals, they can only be chronically helpless, passive, having lots of problems that need us to solve them, mental health patients. If I want them to be a worker, I have to be a customer. If I want them to be an entertainer, I have to be an audience member. I have to take a bunch of different roles, which requires working on ethics and boundaries different than the medical model teaches. And the medical model tends to be about individual, this is my caseload, this is who I take care of, not this is my community. I'm not, I didn't even put that person on my caseload. I'm not responsible for them. No, no, push them away. This is how you get there, not mine. One of the things I, I whipped by in the village, it was a no-fail program. 
Once they put someone in, we couldn't say you're kicked out for abusing drugs or something. We not only couldn't kick them out, we had to keep paying their bills. You're responsible for the community. Medical model is never set up like that. It's up, you're responsible for your caseload, your patients, your clients. That's why they can't do this. Even though we left the state hospital, we kept the same treatment plans, the same staffing problems, the same professional distances, the same culture, the same values. We literally brought the hospital medical model with us rather than inventing something that actually worked in the community and spent the next six years complaining, why don't we rebuild the state hospitals because that's where we're most comfortable working. So what is recovery anyway? Sam says the federal government part that does the services, while well, NIMH does the basic science research, they've been trying to get a definition, and basically they say, recovery is this process, the journey you're on of, of growth and rebuilding, and this process, it, to rebuild a life, you have to have at least something about your health, physically and emotionally, something about a home place to live, some purpose, some meaningful stuff in your day, and some community of set of networks and friends. By the way, does this look suspiciously like the protective factors from Carl's slide way back there? That's how you recover. Notice, this isn't anti-pills or anti-treatment. That was up there in the health and emotional health one. But there's lots more to it. You have to be able to find purpose. You have to find home. You have to have place, people to be around connection. The previous director at LA County Mental Health said, recovery is people, places, and purpose people to connect to, places to belong, and purpose in your life. Here's my, now I want you to enjoy the, the, the uh, uh, animation on this slide. Someone younger than me did this. Ooh, ah. Uh, there are very few Laker fans left. Anyway, that's not the point of this slide. <laughs> I could have, for the policeman, I changed it to Seahawks fans, remember? The, the, um, when you start out, it feels like your illness and your problems have been swallowed you up. This person just crazy, they're all messed up on the streets, it's all swallowed you up. As you move toward recovery, two things are different over there. One is, the illness usually is less. This isn't an anti-treatment model. It's better to have less voices, less mania, less crack addiction, less trauma, less panic attacks. It's better to be more emotionally healthy. You often get people involved in doing things to get this stuff better. That's integrated in the thing. But it's not often cured. It's still there, and you often have to take care of it and keep watching over it. But other things emerge, other roles in life. Because if you only had a smaller illness and the rest of that circle was blank, that wouldn't be recovery. We might call that stability. We would call that living in a group living home or in your parents' garage. It would be existence, not living. Recovery isn't just about getting rid of illness, it's about building life. The other circle. Quick digression. I have multiple digression disorder. Quick digression. You probably have all heard this thing about these rats. They take a rat, and they put it in a cage, and they can rack can press a button and trigger and drip cocaine into its brain. And the rat does it, drips the cocaine in its brain, gets foul time, stops eating, stops sleeping, stops drinking, stops having sex, dies. The only way to save the rat's life is to take the cocaine out of the cage or put it in a cage that doesn't have cocaine in it. And this is where we get the way you get people off of drugs is put them in a program with no drugs in a, in a different cage and keep them there a while so that their brain can restabilize. It, someone else went back to that experiment. And they said, well, that's kind of a lonely cage by yourself with this rat and this lever. What if this is really an exciting cage with a whole bunch of other rats and rat maze and stuff to do and weird food and it makes it a very good rat community. I forget what the name of this was, rat heaven or something. I don't know. Anyway, giant rat exciting cage. And they put the thing that you can get cocaine there. The rats do not press a button all the time. The rats do not get high all the time and destroy their whole lives. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. 
if you have an empty thing and all you've got is I'm a recovered alcoholic or I used to be a crack addict, how long do you think you're going to stay as a, as a dry drunk? That's a very precarious thing with nothing else in the circle. So how do you get from there to there anyway? And by the way, it is not a straight line. Someone asked me this question yesterday. No, it goes like this up and down. And wiggles all over the place. So from this, I borrowed from hospice and Kubler-Ross. So hospice is, Kubler-Ross goes there and she talking to these people who are dying. And instead of asking about their illness, she doesn't ask about how your cancer is doing and how your cell count, stuff like that. She asked how you were doing. How are you handling? How are you not? How's your illness? She found out there people go through these stages. Remember this about denial and anger and bargaining and, and depression and acceptance. And they made a program to help people go through these stages so that you can die with dignity. I started wondering about, well, are there stages to living with dignity, to overcoming something? Came with stages that look like this. says, first, you have to have hope. You have to believe something better is possible. Second, you have to believe that you can do it. Empowerment is a fancy word for believing in yourself. Third, you have to actually take self-responsibility. You can't be caretaken into recovery or protected into recovery. You have to learn from your own mistakes and failures and trying things and take responsibility for your own life. This is true of teenagers too, by the way. Third, <laughs> even while you're messing it up, that's why it goes like this. Fourth one is you have to have some meaningful roles. You can't have an empty circle. Those are stages that we could use like hospice that are stages toward living with dignity and recovery. By the way, you may notice these stages are not illness dependent. Those stages go for getting over a divorce, getting over a rape, getting over a shot, getting over leukemia. They're the stages of grief of losing something and rebuilding your life with that loss. We're helping, when, when we're treating people at our best, we're not helping them grieve the loss and recover and rebuild a new life. And they get stuck and they stop their medicines and it all starts all over again. What can we learn from hospice? I believe hospice is the, the single best recovery program anywhere person-centered thing. And this, by the way, this shows it isn't so airy-fairy. They even figured out how to get Medicare funding for this. Of course, and since then, they've sidelined it and used it for dementia, and there's all kinds of weird things happening, but that's not the point. The point is you can actually fund within our medical establishment person-centered recovery-based programs, and we did it. It's called a hospice for 50 years now. We learned from them. Sometimes the most important thing isn't the recovery from the illness itself, it's from the crippling and destruction or even the stigma and rejection and losses that come from the illness. Some, the people who have the most destruction are the ones who need recovery the most. That person's too sick to do recovery things. No, no. The more things that are going wrong in you as a person, the more you need recovery. If you have some little problems, help with little meds, like my college students, they do fine without any of this recovery. Well, actually, they, I do that with the college students too. So it turns out there's no great disadvantage in adding hope and empowerment, self-responsibility, and meaningful roles to people who are doing well with moderate illnesses, like college students. This, we are facing a lot of frustration currently. Struggling, we can't get these people better. You know, all right, we'll try a couple of hopeful examples. We're all okay, back on these people are all frustrated and things are going to happen. When I went, did hospice as a medical student, I thought it would be the most depressing thing I'd do. Oh, people were dying and we gave up. These are the depressing people in the hospital. In the medical model, these are terribly depressing. We're frustrated, we're powerless, we feel terrible as doctors. We, they're lost cases, you feel terrible. Let's try even more exotic poison and chemo trying to help them. Hospice is not a depressing place. Anybody or any family members go to hospice know this. Hospital is the most full of life, empowering, spiritual, connected, family-driven spot in all of medicine. A good of those frustration was because we were frustrated because we couldn't cure an illness. It, the frustration disappears when you try to help people live with dignity instead. Working and trying to design things recover, even if they don't recover, is far less frustrating than trying to medically cure them when you can't, and then why didn't they take their meds?
This is not, this one in answer to my congressman is not just me saying what this weird thing is. Two pieces of credibility here. One, George W. Bush had a commission on mental health. Don't let shocker fall out of your seat, this happened. This commission, led by Bill Hogan, was the state director in Ohio, said we're beyond the point of tinkering with the medical model or doing this adjustment or adding this into something. If we really want to save this, we have to redo the entire model as a recovery model instead. And by the way, that giant report is still worth looking at. He's got examples from all over the country of things that are being done and how to put it together. Tom Insel I mentioned because I stole the thing from his book. That's a pretty good quote out of the middle of this book. And that's from the guy who ran Samson and says billions of dollars on research on your genetics or something. What's really different about recovery? People say, oh, I'm doing recovery. I like recovery. Oh, yeah, I'm, I've been doing it forever. Oh, yeah, I've, I've, there, I handle this. Yeah. Our state hospital changed the, the sign on the doors. It's Metropolitan Recovery Center now. We, we're recovery now. What's really different? What's the litmus test? Are you really doing this? Is three things. One is, are you paying attention to the person instead of the illness? Kubler Ross made that switch, asking about how are you doing that? How's your cancer doing? Second one is, is it client driven instead of professional driven? Are those your goals or mine? Am I seeing things from your side or mine? That quote you gave about you got to do this and that, that's obviously entirely a professionally driven process. That is not, the person said, can't I be with the person I know? A client-driven process would have been, I can be with the person I know. The professional-driven process is, no, that's kind of inconvenient, inefficient. You miss it, then we're having trouble building enough. we got to get this going from our point of view. This is what we have to do to stay in business. It's not that one's right or wrong, just one is professionally driven and one is client-driven, which side you're looking at. From the professional point of view, that is how you stay in business, the way it's written. They're not just trying to be mean, I hope. And the third one is, are you trying to fix what's wrong? Or are you building up strength so they can be resilient, their protective factors, so they can handle the inevitable things that go wrong? So they can be in our community, not because they're perfect now, because they have enough strengths and they can connect to us because of the positive things. They're not just a bad kid or grown into a bad adult. Let me do a little more on each of those. Those are the three keys, though. The person-centered. I'll do a fancy practice for each of these. Trauma-informed care. Psychiatrists do not believe trauma causes mental illnesses. It's not in the DSM-5. I know they have PTSD, but that is not actually childhood trauma. PTSD is for people who like get one life-threatening, scary thing happens, usually as soldiers, but not necessarily, and they repress them that event within their emotional part of the brain, and the repression isn't full, so it comes out as nightmares and flashbacks. I'm an intrusive thought. Go, I dare you to find in the book someone who was raised by neglectful parents who went through foster care, someone who had their children taken away and leaves a big black hole forever in their life, a rape victim along the, the way, someone who grew up with a bunch of racism in their life, a domestic violence there being beaten, battered women syndrome. I dare you find any of those things in the book. They're not there. The book says what's wrong with you, not what happened to you. Trauma-informed care says what happened to you and how did you that scar you? How did you adapt to it? How did you grow in ways you never wanted to or never expected to? I'm always asking my college kids, you know, things like, so... You had this alcoholic family, you know, a lot of alcoholic families, the kid grows up with like a sixth sense that they know where other people are emotional, not to get to it, and your dad's almost an upset, they can know these emotions, and that leads, you can use that actually as it goes on, your, your friends, you know who's upset, or maybe you do some kind of mental health thing or something because you've got this extra ability. Did you get that particular ability out of that? I can call that a diagnostic criteria of adult children of alcohol, but it's, you adapted to that, you grew because of what came out of from you. Therapy that's about trauma-informed. What did you go through? What have you experienced? How are you re-experiencing it now through both your body and your mind? Rather than what's your illness, 
helps you outgrow. Trauma has built into it the idea of recovery. I recovered from the trauma. Taking it out. They even took out grief last time. It used to be a category for pathological grief. I don't know what's pathological about grief, but pathological grief. And they said, nope, if you're depressed, you meet the criteria. You have a major depression. You deserve treatment, even if your mother just died. Nonsense. This is a huge shift. We're not going to do this whole thing, obviously, because of what happens when you shift from person-centered to illness-centered to person-centered. The foundation of a treatment isn't a diagnosis. It's a relationship. The outcome isn't no symptoms. It's a better life. Moving on isn't when you're cured. It's when you become self-resilient and can handle things with just community support. Every step of the way, it changes how you look at things. This is the number one thing important about recovery is it's person-centered instead of illness-centered. Second one is be becoming client-driven. Now, people don't like this one because that means I have to do whatever they say. They, they just want to get high all the time. I'm supposed to get them high, give them money to get high all the time. This doesn't mean you have to do whatever they say. This means that the ideas and the goals come from them and their priorities and what they want, what's going on in buildings. That you take their desire to be with someone they know, at least as important as our desire to be efficient in our payment structure and come in appointments on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A technique here is shared decision making. I'll give a stress. So shared decision making, this is not the same as informed consent. I'll give an example. So before the pandemic, I used to do lots of traveling, lots of presentations like this, and my wife would come along. And she'd get to like, you know, if it was like today, she'd be like over on the island doing something and I'd be stuck here. But just, so if she wanted to come up, so she, um, we went to New York maybe a decade ago. She wanted to go there because my younger son lives in New York. And I am, one thing that she didn't mention in the introduction is I am an expert in travel and travel books. Written, written lots and lots of travel guides. So we're going to New York, and she wants a, we're going to get her a travel book. This is back when there were bookstores. We go into the Borders or Barnes and Noble bookstore. I'm an expert at this. I know where the travel book section is. I can make a beeline for that. She's distracted by the bargain being up here, you know, which book is $7. And, all right, I go to the back. I find the New York section. I pick out the three best books. She is still back there. I pick out these books. I bring them back to her. I say, here you go, honey, here's your choices, these three books. She just laughs at me. She says, those aren't my choices, those are your choices. That was informed consent. <laughs> she walks by me now, she walks to the back of the, to the selection. I know I've been married 39 years at this point, so I care more about the relationship than being right. <laughs> Ask yourself with your client, do you care more about the relationship or being right? Many people, oh, I'm right. I gave them the advice. They didn't follow it. They didn't do it. I'm right. It's out of my hands. Or do you care about sustaining the relationship, especially when they're doing wrong? She goes there. She picks out the three stupidest books. She picks out the, the National Geographic one with the pretty pictures in it. She picks out New York in my pocket because it'll fit in her purse. She picks out top 10 from the AA, AAA club. These are crappy guidebooks. But I care more about the relationship than being right. I follow her along a little coffee thing on the side where she says, sits down and I bring my three along. Now, my wife is not an idiot. So she looks and she realizes, you know, and by the way, do you think your client's an idiot? And we have lots of interesting words for idiot like non-compliant or sabotaging or manipulative or, you know, no insight or something like this. My wife is not an idiot, so and the stupidest thing she ever did was marry me, but beside that, she's not an idiot. She looks at, she takes better pictures than National Geographic. She doesn't need pictures. She, we've been in New York. She's been to the top 10 sites already. She wants stuff in Brooklyn because that's where my son is, maybe a little walking tour or something over in Brooklyn, and that's not in the AAA guide. But I'm watching her as doing this thing. So I think, you know, I think I know what you want because I am an expert in guidebooks. I go back and I find the Michelin Green Guide to New York. It may surprise you know that a tire company makes guidebooks, but they do. The red ones are for restaurants and hotels. The green ones are sites. 
They don't have many pictures. They're kind of long and skinny. They could fit in your purse, but stick out the top a little bit. They're very detailed with stars, and they have little walking things, and they include second-rate sites. In Brooklyn, there's a whole section in there that so I think this is what you want. So, yeah, it's going to fit my purse. That was shared decision-making. I paid enough attention to what her goals were, what she wanted, what it was like for her, and then used my expertise to find the resource that would match what she needed. Now, of course, this is a lot more fun when you're looking for a guidebook in New York that's got this giant thing. On the other hand, if you're going to Uzbekistan, which she never seems to agree to go to, the number of guidebooks are rather small. And to be fair, your guy's shelf of things available is like absurdly barren. But that still is the same process of what would match your things. What can I, even with these bad choices, or not much on the shelf? That doesn't change the process to here. There's nothing on the shelf, so you have to do what I say because you don't have any choice. I'm the only game in town anyway. That's not shared decision-making either. This isn't just about the power differential. It's also about the perspective. I had to see things the way she, what her priorities were. My priority is not a guidebook you put in your purse. I had to see what she cared about. Man came into my office late one afternoon. He holds up a hand like this. He says, what do you see? I said, I see your hand. He says, no, no, be more specific. I so, you know, guess this man has schizophrenia. I know a lot of people with schizophrenia. He said, all right, it's late, but I can do this. I can see the swirls of your fingerprints. Everyone is different. I can see the creases between your knuckles. I can see your love line and your lifeline. I don't know which one's which, actually. But I can see them. He says, when you can see nails and knuckles and hair, then you will be able to start helping me because you'll be seeing the world from my side instead of from yours. Client-driven is seeing it from their side. Clinical example. I was doing a consultation. They're presenting a case. This guy is like, he has schizophrenia, uses a bunch of drugs, and he beats up his girlfriend, and then the police come by. He says, I'm hearing voices telling me to kill myself, so he goes to the hospital instead of the jail. When the first of the month comes, he says the voices are all gone, gets out, spends his money, more drugs, and this goes round and round and round and round. So, of course, as any of you who work for mental health know, you give this person to your newest young person because he's a good teaching case. Get rid of this pain. In so this young person is presenting him. He's been working for like a year. And I'm like, well, do you have any idea how he got like this? No one plans their life to end up like this. How did he get like this? He says, no, not really. I said, well, you've worked on it for like over a year, don't you know it? He says, well, I'm always in crisis mode. You know, there's some problems with the police. There's problems getting a place to stay, getting his medicine together. There's suicide. There's his complaints. His mother, I got all these things. I never actually just sit to get to know him or a story of, story of his life, how he got like this. I said, okay, that's a shame, but okay. Maybe you should, when there's not some crisis, get to know the person. But how do you think he would describe himself? What? So I told him the back of the hand story. How do you think he would say it from his side of the hand? I don't know. Let's see. He's uh, duly diagnosed. He's manipulative. He's non-compliant. Stop already. No one has ever described themselves as manipulative, duly diagnosed, non-compliant. That's your side of the hand. This guy is so intimidated by this point, he calls him sick the next time I come by for a consultation. <laughs> Finally, the hard-boiled psychologist in the corner who's been pretending to know nothing about this says, I think he would describe himself as a misunderstood prophet of God. He says, yeah, he's out there with that bullhorn that's all this shit and stuff and get in trouble and stuff. Do you know how to fix that? I said, I don't know if I know how to fix that, but I know that a service plan for a misunderstood prophet of God is really different than a service plan for a non-compliant, manipulative, duly diagnosed patient. Is this really recovery? Is it really a plan from their side? Technique here is motivational interviewing, which you guys may or may not know. This is actually one of the best psychological things that's invented. It came out of the substance abuse world. Because you see people using drugs, and you say, you should stop using drugs, go to a program. And they say no, and they don't. And the next time they even lie about using drugs because you punish them because they were 
using them and you didn't let them into something or other, and they keep doing badly. This is not seeing it from their side. This is seeing it from our side. So some of these people said, I wonder how they see it. They, they see the idea of stopping drugs as a big, complicated life decision. And like any big, complicated life decision, it has lots of ambivalence to it. You're closer sometimes, further away, sometimes you go through a different stage, trying to get there. And they, they too identified stages, not stages the addiction goes through, stages the person goes through who's reacting to their addiction. They're in pre-contemplation. They're not even thinking about stopping. They don't tell you the truth about it. They're in contemplation. I might think about stopping sometime, but I don't know. I'm not ready now, and i got too many things going on. It's not that big a problem. I can handle it. But I might sometime in the future think about it. Planning. You know, I would, I'm, I'm getting closer to stopping. I think I might go to a program sometime. You know, what do they do with your cat while you're there? I wonder what I'd tell my boss. How does it go? My wife's kind of been on my back. You know, I'm, I'm starting to give more serious thought to this. All right, I'm ready to take action. I'm going to the program, going to treatment, taking my Suboxone, whatever it is, to try to stop using drugs. And then the stage we neglect far too often. Now I want to sustain this new lifestyle. So it's not that empty circle. So I can keep my sobriety going. This is called motivational interviewing, made up for drug addiction. You can see it looks a little like those four stages I had before. It turns out it's good for lots of things like diabetes, <laughs> losing weight, <laughs> taking your medicine for mental illness. So the motivational interview has been now being taught to lots of doctors and nurses and psychiatrists, and mental health workers for all kinds of stuff of how you see things from their side to guide them through this process. It is fundamentally a client-driven approach. And the people who have struck, they, when they did the first books about this, they just told what I basically just told you. They realized tons of people were having trouble doing this because they were seeing it from their side. What is no, it's whether they need to stop using drugs. That's whether they should stop or not. That's what it looks like from my side. So they wrote a whole other book about that. The relationship is key. The collaborative relationship in this model. It isn't you just do an evidence-based practice, you have an algorithm, you go to the service. It matters whether it's Jeff or Jay or I forget what her name was, that she liked Elaine or something. The relationship is key. This drawing I love, and I put just because it makes a gut reaction in people. It's drawn by a colleague of mine, Dan Fisher, who if you haven't heard of, you can look up his website. Stuff. Dan is a very unusual man. Well, actually, maybe he's not so unusual, but it seems like it. He was an MD, PhD at Harvard, and he got psychotic. He got schizophrenia. He was doing, he was in this lab all by himself with these long hours and doing all this research on neurochemicals. And he decided that my brain is entirely neurochemical and I have no free will. And he ended up in the total catatonic state, couldn't move because the chemicals didn't move with that because he didn't have any will to move them. He ends up in this hospital, ends up on a bunch of meds and there's all these problems going on. And he's struggling in and out for a while. And then Dan decides, you know, I think I do have a will. I think I am a person. I think I do have emotions. Let's see if I can get things going to how I would cope and how I would overcome things. But he says it's enormously different trying to cope and overcome things sitting by myself as in a relationship connecting with people. He drew this picture on a napkin and I have carefully cop copied his artistic genius. The <laughs> he's, look at the guy sitting by himself, his thoughts going around in circles, He's talking to himself, his feelings are going around in circles. You get into like this giant slump. We've all done this, going round and round and round. We all know that the worst thing to do if something's bugging you is sit by yourself, thinking about it for hours and weeks and months and whatever. Look at the other drawing. When you're with someone, it opens up. You're talking to somebody else. You're sharing ideas with the other person, your feelings and heart with another person. Slight aside here, I haven't done a digression in the last 12 minutes. The standard public education for mental illness prevention is mental health first aid. You guys probably have it in some of your settings. This is you teach librarians and teachers and policemen and, front, and everybody, every first responder of any kind, how to recognize signs of mental illnesses, help people not feel ashamed about having this. It's like an illness of anything else. 
even though Insul said it's not like an illness like anything else, and go to a professional and get treatment. By the way, this is a really bad system if you don't have a bunch of professionals to get treatment from. The alternative Dan made up is emotional CPR that says you create a relationship with the person so that they start thinking of different things and you empower them to start coming up with their solutions and stuff and things that within themselves have a way to reconstitute and pull things together and overcome things just as giving them the space to do that within. You learn how to be a really good friend. And you all know of times when you've had some terrible problem, just someone being with you kind of quiet, just they're listening to space and these connections and stuff. They said a little bit, but uh, you suddenly it opened up and you could feel different things than the ones when you're just going around in a circle. Maybe a system that doesn't have any mental health professionals would be better off te teaching emotional CPR than mental health first aid. One is person-centered and one's illness-centered. Third one. This one is one of the least, they're all kind of counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to say, don't worry about fixing an illness, worry about the, what they're doing with their life. You know, don't let the person who's crazy lead the treatment. This is kind of counterintuitive. And this one even more so that says you don't have to fix what's wrong first, build what's right. I'll give you a small example. I've done a lot of presentations like this. And for the first, I don't know how many years, I was more nervous about it. And, and I would carefully read the evaluations, looking for what was wrong, so I can fix all the things that are wrong. And I didn't get any better at all doing that. When I switched to, wait, what are the people like? What am I doing right? <laughs> and let's do more of that. I started doing better. People won't get reintegrated in our society because there's no, we have just scrubbed clean of mental symptoms. They're perfectly fixed all things wrong. Make sure this never happens again. You know, whenever we have a disaster, make sure it'll never happen again. Someone made a mistake, what's to blame? This will never happen again. We'll never have another incidence of police brutality or them stealing all our insurance money or crashing an oil derrick or whatever the hell it is. We'll never have it again. We'll make sure it doesn't happen again. That's the wrong question. The question is, how do we have the strengths to make it through when the inevitable next bad thing happens? Are they strong enough to make it through when they have the voices come back? When they do slip on crack again to get back together and get their life back on track without losing everything again? When they do end up with another bad boyfriend who beats the shit out of them, can they get back again? What are their strengths? Because you're going to connect to the society because of what they like about you. I'm a good worker. I'm an artist. I'm something beside a bad kid. Not, I'm no longer bad. I'm a good kid. We accept a lot of, quote, bad adults who do really cool stuff. Take your favorite example from the world of sports, politics, entertainment, anything for that one. Practical advantages is this model. One, you do not need to start out with an assessment of their illness to access any services. You don't need a small army of mental health professionals to do diagnostic assessments up front for things. You can start out instead with what do they need? It can be social necessity instead of medical necessity, if that's not what the billing is based on. Second is they don't have to agree they have a mental illness or a drug abuse or be traumatized or any of this. They just have to agree they have some problems that you can help them with, some goals that you share. Third, the treatment determination isn't based on what the algorithm says someone with that illness is supposed to get so many sessions of this and so many of this and that and then that. There is no such thing as an algorithm that fits anybody with mental illnesses. All this fidelity of the model with evidence-based practices. Nobody needs one thing done perfectly. That's like going to a concert and they play their scales perfectly. You don't want to see scales. You want to see a piece. You want to see artfully connected, a bunch of different practices put together in a very individualized way, being the person that are added various things in an integrated team to help them get better. The readiness, you don't have to have some symptom relief in order to be ready for something. I don't have to be, you have to be sober before we can give you a job. You have to be no psychosis before you get an apartment. If you're enthusiastic, want to do it, 
Come do it. We'll try it. We'll give you support while you're doing. When you mess up, you'll learn from what's messing up. And as you're learning from what's messing up, you'll be motivated to change things in your life. That's a key feature of the recovery model that's not in the medical model. You don't have to treat the illness first in order to rebuild your life. You can be motivated by rebuilding a life and bumbling along to make changes in yourself. Why is that important? Because that's how real life works. Everything you ever did in your life the first time, you were not prepared and likely to succeed. Think about this. The first time you ever had sex, prepared and likely to succeed or motivated and excited? <laughs> first time you got your apartment, first job you ever had, first marriage you did. Those of you who thought that was a little too funny on your fourth marriage. <laughs> And I dare anybody who's had kids to tell me you were prepared and likely to succeed when that first kid came along. I just hope you were motivated and excited, and then you learn by bumbling along. Hopefully with some support with people helping you bumble and learn by doing. That first coworker, the first apartment person, your parents came down and coached side and alone and like this. Your mother-in-law came in with some giant pain in the ass trying to raise kids. Whatever. You learn by bumbling and doing it. The same thing is true of them, which means our job is not to prepare people and get them perfectly well in order to be likely to succeed. It's to help them get in a place and then be with them while they bumble. You don't abandon them. Be with them while they bumble, learning by the bumble, so the fourth apartment works. That's why you're so much better on the fourth kid. No. Um... That's you guys get the rest of it. One more break. A financial interlude. The LA Times last month had an article about Suboxone. So Suboxone, for those who don't know, is very popular for opiate addiction. It's an MAT, medical-assisted treatment. The idea here is if you're on heroin or worse, fentanyl, and Suboxone is there, it's an opiate there. So what it does is two things. It blocks enough so you're not going to die of an overdose from your fentanyl. And if you don't have any heroin or fentanyl to get, it will block some of the cravings and the withdrawal so you won't come down as hard as you don't like steel to get you know, Jones as much. And hopefully if you can get over that craving, you might even stop altogether. New pill, it's been maybe six or seven years. It's supposed to be given by doctors who have particular uh, trainings to do this within some drug rehab as well. They came out recently with this in a month-long shot. Now, this is super cool. You get the shot for a month. You're not going to overdose and die on the streets. You're not going to um, uh, have much cravings when you, have, when you run out in between. You don't have to remember it each day. This shot costs $1,800 for a month shot. The LA Times says, why is this so hard to get? Why can't we get this approved? What's happening? This would save lives. We've got this terrible disaster. From an illness point of view, that's a really good idea. If you have unlimited money and resources, this is a really good idea. But what I never see compared is a person that's in a book that says, what could you buy instead with that same money? The pills cost about $100 or $200 a month. What if I actually added to that a housing subsidy? Let's make it $900 so you can actually pay for something and you put in some of your own money you got, maybe more you need. How about a $300 a month case manager to come out and help you and bumble along with you while you're learning things with a caseload like 15 to 1? We'll give you a $300 a month membership in a clubhouse. That's all cut for 100 members in the clubhouse to run one. So you have a place to belong and connect and usefulness and being there. We'll give you a hundred dollars of uh, LVN coming out and handing you these pills and keeping track of them so you don't lose the month long pills and stand the pills. Which of those packages do you think is more likely to lead to growth and recovery? We never ask this question. We never balance the two things against each other. The megaphone belongs to the drug companies, which by the way, made $244 million from that shot last year and are on advertising and lobbying heavily to make $1 billion this year. I'm not against this shot. This is a great idea. 
But where's the lobbyists for clubhouses, acting case managers, LVNs, housing supports? Where are those lobbyists? It could be a few legislators. You get a lot of lobbyists from those people. I bet you get more lobbyists from drug companies saying, can you put this on the Medicaid registry to pay for this? And it is now on California's Medicaid registry. I'm not arguing against a shot. Don't get me wrong. This sounds like a great idea. I'm arguing when we figure out what to do with whatever resources we've got, both money and people, if we stay in that original medical model and we choose only things that are illness-centered, professionally driven, and deficit-based, we're not going to have as nearly as dramatic an effect as we would have otherwise. This is one of the main things the village did was spend its money differently. This was an accounting from the first three years. Notice this is not anti-meds. Meds are almost exactly the same. 10%, 11% money went on meds. The traditional symptom, the control group, look what they spent their money on. Therapy, acute hospitalization, and long-term. In California, there's like nursing homes that said long-term hospital. That took over three quarters of their money. Look what the village spent our money on. Case managers, to make sure everything gets right and we're going alongside learning all these things. Only a third of our staff were professionals. Two thirds were paraprofessionals or uh, peers. In case you have to have a shortage of professionals around here by any chance. Socialization, 11%. And employment, 25%. Remember, we had 400% increase in employment and three quarters tried working. It took a lot of money to do that. We saved so much money out of the hospitalization. The second year, we bought a money manager payee, a job developer, and a social outreach worker with the money. Because it was set up as a capitated system, we could use the money and move it around to somewhere else, which is not the way the system is normally set up. How the money spent makes a difference. Three ways for making things worse without really intending to. I don't think anyone's intending to make anything worse. One is, many places, including both Washington and uh, California, have tried to integrate their mental health in with the medical services, integrate mental health into health services overall. Let's put it together, get integrated, so you get these things together and sort of thing. The problem with that is, one of the problems with that is, the medical services are even more medical model than the psychiatric services are. Which, by the way, when we started doing this, I wrote an article that said, top 10 things that the medical system could learn from the psychiatric re- uh, recovery model that they could use to apply to all these people with diabetes that they're having troubles with. But we're little and they're big. We're not going to change their culture. They're going to influence ours. And so it made it even more medical model when you gave it to the same companies and things to do where we're thinking things medically integrated psychiatrists working in community health clinics act even more medical models than ones working in clubhouses. Second thing we did is many counties and many places get sick of trying to work out this business about the cost and how you pay for it and this more paperwork and less and it's acceptable or unacceptable and these things. And can we just hire someone to manage these costs and fee things? When we hire someone to manage these costs and fee things, A, they always do it medical model. They don't manage them in a person-centered recovery way. We tried to teach Magellan how to do this once 10 years ago. They always do it medical model. And their incentive is to control costs, not to be socially responsible or decrease the number of police calls. That's not, you're not paying them for that. You don't say we're going to give you more money, there's less police calls, or less money, there's less. You don't give them social outcomes. You don't even give them the quality of life outcomes. You give them symptom medical outcomes. Not even that. Is the treatment match the algorithm for what was medically indicated for that diagnosis? And by doing that, you eliminated all the person-centered things, all the protective things, and you made their incentives about controlling costs instead of increasing accessibility and increasing the variety of services. And our own griping, our own frustrations, our own focusing on people doing badly makes it sound like this is hopeless. It makes everyone say, oh, I guess anything more. And we bet your those guys are right. We better lock up more people. You guys can't pull this off. Because we're 
because we suffer when people do badly. That was 30 years ago, 1990. Here's a list of services that have been invented in the last 30 years that nobody's doing either. <laughs> I am not going to show you th whatever this is, 16 more slides of all these services. But the same principle applies. There's people doing things at work all over the place that aren't within our system because they're not medical model, they're not funded by our system, they're not within the narrative of their, what we're doing. Every single one of these things is person-centered, client-driven, and strengths-based interventions. That's why they're not being done, even though they've all been invented in the last 30 years. If you were creating a new village model today, you would put all of those in it. That there's emotional CPR, by the way, the last one I mentioned about Dan Fisher is the bottom of the list. This is why if you stay with the current model, if you stay with your teacup filled with the way of looking at things, you're never going to implement any of these things that keep being invented, and you're going to keep looking around as though something new needs to come, and it's new even though it's 30 years old. All right, last slide before break, and I want you to really appreciate this one. It took me like an hour to make. I had to watch three YouTube videos. Dun, 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 ta -da. <laughs> Impressed, aren't you? <laughs> I'll put it in a way you can actually read it. <laughs> Yes, I am a little bitter against the medical model. Perhaps to call them the Death Star would be a little too far. <laughs> Recovery looks like the little rebel bases scattered all over the place. And you bring people from programming to this, we're like the little Jedis hiding in the corner. The force is with us, but we're still rather weak on the edges. And no, no one's going to do a lucky shot that goes to do the thing, boom, and blows up the whole system. But when you're thinking about what to build here, what to rebuild, what to do with that. Instead of what can we build that the establishment goes with what the empire is doing, what would it be if we built rebel bases of stuff or try to do things? All right, 10 minute break till 11 o'clock. So, realistically, is there hope? Seems like, ha I don't know how many of you, like, like me, watched on the Disney Plus the new Star Wars backstory from last week. But, and I, I shouldn't ruin it for you all, but Obi-Wan Kenobi is wondering, is there hope? Is it going to, is it going to, going to be able to do anything going forwards? Or is he, should he just hide off and it's not going to work out and just protect himself and his family? The, the, so there are people doing a lot of cool stuff because recovery programs have a way of, propping up like weeds. Because the stuff, it isn't made up by some elaborate theory from Samson or NMH or some commission. It's made up off people off the streets trying things. Every time I do a presentation, even the ones yesterday, including the ones yesterday, I should say, because someone will come up and say, hey, I've been doing that. We figured out how to do that. And you just gave me the rationale to understand why what I came up with works. The policeman told us that this morning. The uh, that it's not, this is stuff that actually can grow from bottom up for people who are just doing things and figuring out what works outside of it. So it grows up like weeds. The good thing about that is you, well, I don't know about here because you, everything grows like weeds, but the, is that nothing grows anymore in California. We don't, haven't had, it rained for three days in the entire last year and a half in Los Angeles. Um, but, so example, so weeds are kind of hard to destroy entirely. They keep popping up all the place, but it's also hard to make a system out of. It. So here are some examples of some weeds I like. One is a lady who was hardworking advocate, leftover hippie from the '60s, who um, went down to Skid Row in Los Angeles and got a couple of homeless people to help her and set up uh, LA Men's Place. Became Lamp, and if any of you saw the soloist the movie, that was actually filmed in Skid Row, and that is Lamp. Um, Molly also died a couple years ago. Um, the next one is me, a psychiatrist who's worked down, this, down in Skid Row. He says, oh, this person won't come in. Is there a rule against taking a shot to them in their crummy hotel room? Well, 
No, we never heard of anybody doing that before, but there's no rule against it, I suppose. So I carried it with Giver and a shot there. A priest who became an amazing political advocate, building community support, inspiring people, and getting literally billions of dollars in money into California's mental health system. An ex-jail warden. We literally hired the city guy around the city jail became our community integration worker to help our, the community. Um, he would teach us how to be good citizens. He'd be taking our members to help out at um, like runs or the Long Beach Marathon or he shaved his head for cancer things. It wasn't like, what can the community do for us? How can we be contributing and giving to show to be good citizens? And he came from this jail police background. It was a, a social worker who joined the local police force. A mother in Santa Monica, whose son was sitting in a board and carrier guy's um, uh, living homes, had nothing to do all day, who set up a drop-in center with groups and activities and stuff so he'd have things to do. Became a rather large program after a while. A couple I met in the Czech Republic, who were rather idealistic, who bought this amazing old little medieval church and the pastor's house in it and then set up these looms and stuff and starting having people with mental illness come by and stay with them and come all the day and do these various jobs. When they had a couple of kids, they decided not to have them living with them anymore, so they had these housing programs. And they were running like eight different businesses scattered around this town in a social center just out of their idealism because they went to some summer program in college about how to help people. And this guy's from Washington, too, an ex-shop teacher <laughs> who takes kids on multi-day long walks in Europe. He found a wealthy lady to help fund this um, to help them find what their core gifts and their purpose are. And those weeds are just my friends. There's lots of people who are weeds who aren't my friends. Those are just ones who are my friends. But can we do more than be weeds? Can we build an actual system? of care. And to build an actual system of care, we need five things to do it. We need a vision of what the system looks like. We need to reform the funding so it pays for things and, and how staff are held accountable for things. We need places for people to connect to other people to do this. You have to have some place to be for this to be. We need to change who is doing the work and how they're trained and how they're supported in the work to avoid burnout, which is so common today. And we need to build widespread community support and inclusion so the community doesn't keep rejecting everybody. I'm going to spend a little bit on each of these things to be to give an idea. It is way easier to be a critic and a bomb thrower and a Che Guevara blowing up things than it is to be a Nelson Mandela building things from the inside as a, a reformer. The last quote there was is what, once again from my wife's friend, who's the, the, the uh, congressman who was talking this conversation. So I'm doing all these details. I think he had enough after I said, all right, if, the gov if, if, you're, if you were the governor, what's the one thing you would do to fix homelessness? Like, there isn't one thing. It doesn't work like that. I can tell you the aspects of a giant system will include all kinds of stuff to make this happen. If you do one thing, it's not going to work, no matter what the one thing is. All right, let's start with the vision. There's a, a lot of people who in life, they get excluded from life. They want you end up isolated and wandering and bumping around and floating away from us all on this river of suffering. Remember back in third grade, the kid who like pooped in his pants and chased the little girls around and was a problem and they, he disappeared someday? He's like homeless now. Remember the the person who came as an immigrant from another country, didn't speak the language at all and couldn't get through doing anything and couldn't get a job. She's like homeless now. There's lots of someone who was at Harvard and had schizophrenia and couldn't make it in any program in a building. He ended up homeless, excluded by himself, disappearing. There's lots and lots of ways to drift away in our world, to be rejected. All kinds of things can happen. A teenager who's being raped by her dad at night and runs away at 14 ends up on the streets and can't rebuild her life from that. 
there's so many ways to get drifted away in our world. And you drift away by yourself, isolated, rejected, and this river of suffering goes by lots of terrible places. It goes by homelessness, it goes by jail, it goes by hospital, it goes by suicide, it goes by violence, more often the victim than the perpetrator, but both. It goes by early death, it goes by being disruptive to your community. And when people see people like this in the river, they're compassionate You oftentimes. Their heart goes out to them. Why don't we help these people? Not that I don't want the river to come any closer to me. Help them over there, please. And can you build a program that's like an island in the river, preferably? Can you build a state hospital someplace far away to send them to? Or a jail or prison? Or a, it's a housing project. You better put it on a block with no neighbors so it's nobody... Put it over there someplace. Or did they not come here? The problem with building things that are islands is they're out of sight and out of mind. And sooner or later, they start losing their funding and their support. When there's bad times and there's crisis and stuff, suddenly, you know, whatever happened to that program? It drifts away and drifts away and drifts away. But even more importantly, it loses compassion. Because it's out of sight, it's out of things, it's hidden, dark corners. It doesn't matter who's running this. When the mental health people were running these out of sight hospitals, we ended up in lines of people getting lobotomies and throwing bodies in the back and all that. It's like, how the heck? What the hell happened to us? When the police start running jails and we don't take them into mental health and put these awards and they're stuck there for months at a time and down in Miami, they ended up turning the off the, the water so it comes out only hot, scalding water with little peak call to watch the, the inmates burn and their flesh melt. What the hell happened? What's wrong? When as a neighbor you end up screaming at somebody and throwing rocks to get rid of them, can you get, get out of my place? I'm frustrated. I'm overwhelmed. After a while, it's can you get out of here? Can you we, we lose compassion for people who are not connected? You're vulnerable when you're not connected. You lose compassion. You disappear. Building programs in the river doesn't work, even though we keep trying to do that. What you have to build is a bridge back to the community. That starts in the river. There's a whole bunch of people who like wade into the river to help people out who are in the river and fish them out and get them out of there. Some are drowning, some are just going along and you're trying to get them out and come on back on shore and then they drown somewhere and you pull them back out. And they go back out and they pull them back out. And go, Keep doing something back. Yes, there's policemen doing this, but there's homeless outreach workers. I hear you guys have like eight homeless outreach teams there. There's lots of other people too. There's people who like to do immigrant rights in this and people who are like ex comments and housing rights and, and racial things. There's all kinds of people trying to help these people. Can we help you back? People help suicide, run suicide hotlines. People who look for rape victims, the shelters for battered women. These are all, can we get you out of this river? get you on the shore a bit. And actually, many of the people working in this river that no one wants to go by their own house, they have a special reason to be abnormal in a certain special way. That their hearts go out to people that other people say, keep away from me. And many times it's because they were in the river for some reason themselves along the way. I saw it to the college students who say, I want to make sure to work, I want to work as a school counselor to make sure somebody is listening to third graders who are getting molested because no one listened to me. People at the river helping people out to come out. Then you've got a long way to get back to the community. You're really messed up. Let's assess the damages, what's wrong, what's going, what do you need along the way here? Is your mental health a mess? How about your substance abuse? How about your physical health? How about your emotional thing? If you just lash out at everybody, you got all these problems with trust. You got no job skills. You're incredibly impoverished. That's a common one. Did you lose your family? Were your kids taken away? What's the damage here? Let's start building. Sometimes it's building, not rebuilding. Building the skills up back up the bridge to the community. And we help you bumble along alongside building, building, going back up, and you slide down and mess it up and like, Remember, say the fourth apartment works. Our job, uh, Paul said that the uh, 
average American who doesn't have mental illness. It's their seventh job that they hold for six months. Their seventh job. <laughs> Keep trying to work back away. Slide down, slide up and down. You go for it with three more guys who are terrible and beat you up before you. I <laughs> Keep going back and you go, you have relapse. You know, keep going back and you try to make it, kind of make it. You get back to the top. And if you just stop there and you all right, I'm stable. I made it. I'm not in the river anymore. I, just, I don't want to climb anymore. Just leave me here. I don't need to do anything. Just leave me here. That's better than being in the river. But it's still awfully vulnerable because you're not being self, so you're not sufficient. You're not connected to the community. You're not self sufficient You're dependent on the system. And the system comes and goes in really mean, weird ways. You can't rely on us being all the time. You're still vulnerable. Keep working your way up to be able to reconnect. What can my role be in the community? Can I reconnect to my family? Can I have a real job? Can I have a real apartment? Can I have a real vacation? Can I go to a real church? Can I belong to a biking group? Hiking club. I do, do things. Then I'm connected and stuff. This isn't like a safety net. This is a web of relationships that holds you together. That's the vision. And of course, it'd be nice to do some prevention so not so many people land in the river in the first place. But people are going to keep landing in. You can build 75 units and you'll have new people in the river. They're going to need help too. It's a river that keeps coming by. So that's, we said, what do you need to make a whole system? You need a vision. That's my vision is this river. You can make it more practical. It says, all right, so if you got the three stages, the engagement down at the river bank, the rebuilding is working your way back up and arrival as a community. Or as a friend of mine said who uh, worked with transitional age youth kids, he called it rocking in tuning up and rolling out. No, rolling in, ro tuning up and rocking out. <laughs> Got to get this right. <laughs> He's much better at that than I am. You can think of, say, so where am I? How would, in this giant bridge, where does my program fit into this? I help employment for people who are just at the bottom. I just give them a day employment, something to do for the day. So they can see themselves as an employer. I do these internships to help you do that with a job coach coming alongside this. I help provide real employment to people who have proved themselves through a job, twice they get an ongoing job, even with a crime on their background and two suicide attempts and three hospitalizations. Where are you along the way for these various things? What are our holes? What are we missing? What do I do best? And by the way, it's an extremely rare staff or program that does all three well. The people down in there. River aren't so good at connecting the community. <laughs> Rebuilding don't necessarily do so good when you drown again. The people who are in the in the community don't necessarily do so good at rebuilding. You're better. It, people tend to be good at programs that are good at one or the other to keep moving to be a bridge together. This one's more elaborate. elaborate. We don't need to go into is the, the mental health aspects of what's going on inside of you, what's going on in your relationships what's going on in your purpose or your roles along the way as you're going across that bridge to reconnect. What kind of help does people need? I'm showing you this, this slide not to get every detail to get, this is a, you need an integrating vision to have an integrated system. This river, which is compelling that people can see, is the vision. All right, how about accountability? How about those managed care plans that I keep harassing about? So about 20 years, 15 years ago, we thought managed care was coming to mental health. And a bunch of people doing recovery said, so let's get ahead of it and build a tool to do managed care plans. It wouldn't be illness better recovery driven. And we created it. It's called the Milestones of Recovery Scale. I won't go through it in detail, but just give you the idea of what this is. You rate each person on three scales. One is how much risk is going on in their life? How much terrible stuff is happening? How much skills and support do they have? Are they rebuilding? And how engaged or connected are they? At the beginning, they're unconnected, then they get connected, and then you want them to become unconnected again, actually, as they move on. And you can make this set of seven scales there. 
from extreme risk, they're drowning in the river, high risk but engaged, they're working with us but they're making a lot of mistakes and a lot of bad things are happening, high risk unengaged, they're getting a lot of problems and they're not connected to any services, poorly coping, unengaged is they're not getting in a lot of problems but they're not doing much either and they're not connected. NAMI cares a great deal about this group. This is people hidden back of their families, not doing much and not connected to anything. Poorly coping, engage is people are with us and they're not doing, it's not going very well, but they're stable and not getting any trouble. So we call that stable and we just move on to the next one. Then coping, rehabilitating is you want to do things, you're working on things and you're bumbling and messing them up. You need a lot of help alongside. Early recovery is you're doing a lot better. You can do things a lot more independently. You can handle things. You don't need as much guidance. And eight is you don't need to be connected to us at all. And the people, you can think of the people you work with. Where are they now? This takes like one minute to rate somebody. It's not like a big giant paperwork thing with 72 items. Where are they along the way? You can go up and back in different ways. Now, why is this a managed care tool? <laughs> one is... When you rate the person, you can say what services that person should have. Do they need engagement services? Do they need risk prevention services? Do they need motivation services? Do they need outreach services? Do they need supportive skill building services? Do they need community integration services? Do they need self-sufficiency building services? We actually made packets for these are the services that go with each of these things. Believe it or not, I made that up in Singapore. We, I was training on this in Singapore, and they're very rigid, and they've gone everything. All right, what's the paddle? I get people with this one, this one, this one, this one. So we made these packages for them. That ought to serve well with the rigid managed care people. The, they can't be more rigid than those people in Singapore were. And you could write a contract for the outcome that would have two things to it. One is, did the person move forward in their recovery? So if I gave you 50 number twos, high risk, unengaged. People that are drawing a giant pain in the ass. They're not doing something super dangerous right now. I didn't have to lock them up. So I walked off as a police to the outreach thing, but they're there in that problem. I just gave to your part. Here's that 50 names. You can't kick them out. That's yours. And I come back a year later. My contract would be, did no more than five end up in extreme risk of something terrible happen going backwards? There are no more than five or 10 of them still at this level. Did you engage at least 20 of them? They stayed high risk. Did some of them you progress to move them on? How many got to four? How many did you got even further? Did you get like three or four even further moving on? You could benchmark which programs do better at moving people on with a different, so that could be your contract. I gave you fours, what did you do with them? I gave you twos, what did you do with them? I gave you sixes, what did you do with them? Did you offer the services to go with that? Did they move forward? And also, How's their quality of life on the things we care about socially? That one looks like this. Do they, where are they living? Are they employed? Are they in school? Or they have legal problems? They have financial things like conservatorship or payee? Are they in jail or hospital? You saw those first data I saw showed you about like 70% reduction, 400%. Those are really good political kinds of data. We sent that data up to Arnold Schwarzenegger a long time ago, and that saved the entire program. Just three num just four numbers, decrease in homelessness, jailing, hospitalization, and increased employment. He said, that sounds good. And he and he didn't erase it, and it was gonna get cut. The accountability is for the people's recovery, not their symptom relief, or how many minutes you spent doing something. And for their quality of life outcomes. For the staff here, this is the holy grail because it eliminated all the Medicaid paperwork. All those three hours a day of charting of what are you, did I, I did, you know, this practice and went around because of this indication, this and this and how many minutes you spent all this stuff. You don't need any of that. The charts can look like I spent so much time with this person working on this goal and this is what happened over the course of a month. And they, at the each month, what level are they at? And if they moved their housing or went to jail, I wrote that down. That's the end of the charting. That's what the accountability system of a recovery system could look like. We came this close to in Hollywood 
getting a $200 million experiment to try this. And then the, and the Board of Supervisors chickened out. Here's what the system looks like. This admittedly is a complicated slide, but I'm showing it to show that this isn't just weeds. This could be a symptom, system every bit as coherent as our curtain one. So we've got on here, where's my, where's my thing? We've got on the top here, the, our levels, extreme risk, drowning, unengaged, you need engaged, engaged but not self-coordinating, that's the fours, fives, and sixes, they're in the rebuilding, and the self-responsible up at sevens and sixes and sevens arriving. The services, this is, people usually need lock settings, these people need outreach and engagement or a drop-in center, these people need intensive case management of its risk or just case management team for these supportive services. These people need a clinic or a wellness uh, center. Notice, by the way, the mismatch, the person you talked about in the first place. You, you've got to come to an appointment and make these three appointments to get your meds. It's not likely that person is arriving a self-responsible. That's the wrong level of service for that person's level of recovery is why it's not matching. If he was good enough to do that, he'd be already a six or a seven. Is he really? That, that agency has to offer services that are around outreach and case management or dropping in, not around appointments, because appointments only work for people who are quite self-responsible. By the way, this is true of dependency court and high school and a whole lot of other things that aren't responsible to have a lot of appointments, college even. Here's the services for each of these levels. My point in this slide is, not to teach you every detail of the slide, is that's a system of care. Remember, the point of this part is, how do you get past weeds? We've got a vision. We've got a financial way of doing things. We've got what the service systems would look like, the packages. We've got that element. It could be done. We created some of this in Long Beach. What is this? Here's the managed care approach. Managed care, once again, you don't need to learn every detail. Managed care on the one side is consists of case managers who go around and figure out, did you meet the, the criteria for the care? We're going to deny care, pay per care, approve for it, how much money, what's your contract, who's the person, do they make the thing, do you get more sessions, that kind of thing. Design care gives the money as a capitation to the program and the staff team and, the st and say, you get this much money, different amount depending on where they are in recovery, provide the services, show the outcomes, and you decide based on the person's needs where the money goes to. So when we had a team that we'd have conversations like, we can send them to the hospital and pay, at that time it was $400, now it's like $1,400. We give it $400 a night for the hospital, or is there anything else we could do for $400 to spend the money in some other way? How about a peer to hang out with them at night and give them a pizza or a movie ticket so they're not su suicidal? How about being able to buy them some textbooks because they didn't get their grant in on time to go to school? How about buying them a couple nights in a hotel for respite? Can we buy things like this? We spend the money based on the person's needs and it comes out of our capital fund being not approved by another case manager. The case manager is actually the person who's coordinating the care on behalf of the person. We actually changed the name of that to person service coordinator. Details once again, but that's the premise. And managed care can be designed in care instead. Three, places for people to connect. You may have noticed that before I had things like called drop-in centers or, or uh, or welcoming things or, or, or wellness centers. If you think about what people need to recover, what needs to be the emotions of the place, for those who are really old may remember it's called milieu therapy, that the place itself had a healing nature to it. It's not just coming for an office for an appointment for this and this happened, it is the place itself, what's the culture, what's it feel like? A weird example, I haven't done the digression since the break. One day I was at our local courthouse because one of the uh, uh, patients had slugged me. And she, we were getting a restraining order so she couldn't slug me again. 
And I, so I went down to the court building. The 95% of the people in the, in the restraining order line are battered women. And the customer service there treated them like they just didn't matter, like they were, you couldn't, no one was responsive. They were saying they wouldn't come to the front. They'd tell you, paper and push it back. There was no sense of when the line was or how long when the judge would call you, the judge was kind of, they'd say things, all right, serve it. He said, I'm terribly frightened of this guy. It's tough, you have to do this or this money they didn't have. The whole thing reinforced the idea that these women weren't worth anything. What you actually want there, if you're supposed to be helping battered women, is a culture of women empowerment. There should be like posters of famous women doing well and we love you, you're important and what are yours? trying to do and how you get help and here's someone who's been through this before helping it to the mind make it important what are the problems and how can I help you secure this should be all designed the culture around getting these women to believe in themselves enough to be able to leave if that's 90% of the service I mean I was an outlier that's not why I was there I didn't particularly need empowerment but all of them sure did and they weren't getting it there so four different things you can think of as ways of organizing these spaces once again, not here's our schizophrenia clinic, here's our panic disorder clinic. One is a welcoming center, a place you come into and you feel welcome and belonging. An example of one of these I saw in, I got to do a presentation. Sorry, I used to get to go fly to all kinds of cool places before the pandemic. I went to Auckland, New Zealand. No, it, this was, I was in Auckland, New Zealand, but it was Wellington, New Zealand. And in New Zealand, the Maori people have this idea of this building. I think it's called a hangi, I can't remember. That's this building that's your home base that they come back to where their home mountain and their home village, and this is their ancestors in the building. It looks like a person that's built like this. So in Wellington, kind of in the slums and the ship, ship, shipyard, they had a hangi or welcoming place for people who had no welcoming place. It was literally built out of scraps of wood that was left off these ships and stuff coming in that they kind of put together. It must have violated every building code in existence. Everything was whopper jawed. I don't even, it was like this weird maze. They just added things gradually to it. But what really impressed me about was while I was there going through this, this guy comes in who is super dirty, super messed up, probably on drugs. And they greeted him like, it's so great to see you again, to see you around again. You're so well. We love you here. Great. How have you been? Come on in. We help you. Just your long lost friend. Welcome home to your ancestral building. This is where you belong, even though you have no other home. I heard of one they were building in San Francisco for gay people showing up to welcome you there before the speed dealers got to you. <laughs> What does your community need to welcome? Like what, what, what shows up here? Probably not Maoris and gays, but what shows up here? Sanctuary is almost everybody needs a place to let down their guard, to feel safe, to have, take a breath, to assess the damage, to be able to think of what I've been through. They've been in survival mode and spinning around, so I'm just about to come down to be those two people connected to tech connected. Some place of sanctuary where I can be quiet. I know I'm safe here. I can take a break from all the stuff out in the community, all the stuff in the streets, all the dangerous stuff. I, this is a safe place where I can have some place to do some healing. You need to have some security in order to take the risk to grow. Third one is a refugee center. I decided that hospitals are refugee centers. We send people there and become refugees in their own country. Or maybe they're from somewhere else, but in their own country. You don't go to a hospital for medical necessity, regardless of what you guys write on all that paperwork and how you build Medicaid. You go there because somebody can't put up with you anymore. Maybe you can't put up with yourself anymore and you want to kill yourself, or some parents, somebody can't put up with yourself, you become a refugee. And so I started learning about refugee centers, like Sweden has refugee centers, and refugee centers offer some treatment, they offer redocumentation. They offer some um, connection to other people, refugees for your identity going on, how to be a good citizen to reconnect. What did you do wrong to re reconnect, to be able to be a good citizen here? And what's your niches to help you find the community that connects to you? And usually some political advocacy on behalf of this refugee community. We can build refugee 
Center for People Who Become Refugees around how much do these services to help you find a place of belonging you can be like the Ellis Islands. And healing centers. Most of these people were focused for a long time on the engagement and the drug abuse or the psychosis or the housing or these poverty stuff. But when you get down with all that, or even behind all that, these people have been terribly traumatized and rejected in lots and lots of ways. And they need not just things and not just ideas, but they need emotional connections and healing that we used to call therapy before we turned therapy into doing skill development only. They need the emotionally healing. This doesn't have to come from a professional. It can be healing from a lot of uh, different ways. Healing can sometimes be intellectual. It can be usually emotional. It can be spiritual healing. AA meetings are usually healing places with no professionals at all to help you heal and work through your moral inventory steps and the other steps along the way as you do things. The, to be able to get yourself back again, to be whole again, to really recover. Do we have spaces that are welcoming, sanctuary, uh, refugee, and healing things? Because if you don't have the spaces, it's hard to have a system with no place for it to be. Now, when you make these spaces, oh, all right, so one, before I go, is this is a tool we made up for the culture of the program. Went around and asked a lot of programs doing things. What are you doing? And we came with this, are you welcoming? Is it growth oriented? Do you include consumers? That was both the staff and in their own roles as directing their treatment. Is it an emotionally healing place? Does it focus on quality of life or just symptoms? Does it connect to the community? Is it integrating with the community? And last one I throw in, in how's the staff doing? Many times staff aren't being treated well enough to treat the clients like this. If you want the clients to be, hopefully the staff have to be, hopefully. Well, the clients to be empowered, the staff have to be empowered. Clients to be self-responsible, the staff have to be self-responsible. Clients to have community roles, the staff have to be community roles. If you have burnt out, hopeless staff hiding in their offices, that's going to lead to burnt out clients hiding in the bushes. We went through, this is one of these things. There's a bunch of indicators. You use it for a map for yourself. You see where we're at. And then you make plans, what can we move forward, what are other people doing? It's an actual tool we created for the cult, recovery culture of the place. Now, one of the huge problems with these places and cultures of any kind, and I alluded to it back with the, the state hospitals and the Miami jail, is that you can get traumatized as your culture, you can get worn down, you can get beaten up, you can get frustrated. We all know a lot about vicarious trauma that, you know, somebody who's terribly depressed and suicidal and you're trying to cheer them up and by the time you're done, you're depressed and suicidal and they're not cheered up at all. You're trying to get someone sober and then you're finished dealing with them, you go out and get a drink. You're trying to make them feel empowered and you feel broken down, I don't have anything. That you have to watch out if you're getting involved emotionally with people like this, that you don't end up sinking with them rather than healing. You need something that's a corrective emotional experience that's sustainable and winnable from your side. This also happens in programs. So if you're running a battered women's shelter, there's a good chance after a while the staff are going to start feeling battered and, worth, and worthless and not much and nobody cares about us and lone power. You're running a transitional age youth program. And before you know it, the staff are kind of rebellious, not following any rules, don't do anything, right? And spinning around, little antisocial on the side. You're running a homeless program, and pretty soon the program starts feeling like nobody wants me around, there's no home here, that everyone just wish my whole program would disappear. You're running a program for serious mental people who feel unwelcome and useless, and the program starts feeling unwelcome and useless. Whatever you're with, so they don't drag you down the same thing while you're trying to help, you have to come with something that is sustainable and winnable, like a time like, all right, let's be about women's empowerment in the courthouse there. Example, we were running a street team for people with mental illness, substance abuse, and physical problems who had high vulnerability and likely to die on the streets. They targeted, I think it was like 100 people like that to give to our team. Expensive service, lots, lots of integrative stuff, 
Probably if you were little, you'd die. And even with our help, they literally died. This program would have like a death every month or so, which was way down from what was before, but it's still a death every month or so. And so this is Jim Peter down. So I said to the director, so what do you think the trauma is this group is bringing to you? She said, well, it's helpless. It's passive. It's fatalistic. It doesn't matter what we do. I'm going to die anyway. All right. And so what's your corrective emotion? Do we respond to try to overcome that? It's not fatalistic. It's helpless. We'll work as hard as we're going to save you. I said, well, that is corrective, but there's two big problems with it. It's not sustainable and it's not winnable. If you say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you better and better and do things while you're fatalistic, you're going to burn out. That's not sustainable, that relationship. And if you say, I'm going to save you and the person dies, it just shattered your own thing and you've gone downhill. I said, you might be better off with a hospice approach that says, you may well die. You were selected for high vulnerability, facing terrible things that are hard to overcome. That makes every moment with you more special. That makes it more important to get you housed before you die or to reconnect your family so you can go back to the reservation and die with them instead of here in a hotel room by yourself. I don't know if I'll see you next week, so that makes it more time. What are we going to do with this? Notice that one is sustainable. You don't burn out feeling like that. And it's winnable. When the person died, if it was either quality time, we connect them with the family, we do these things, it was a better death. We succeeded even when they died. Whatever your program space is, needs to attend to the emotions of the culture of the place. Not just what the program design is. The place has to have a soul or a heart, depending on how you look at it. Or both, probably. <laughs> All right. Four. We did, I'm almost there, vision, we did vi vision, we did accountability and funding, we did the places. This one is, how about the staff? Who are you hiring? Now, and I alluded this a minute ago, it's very important to use the same recovery values in dealing with your staff as dealing with your clients. You can't expect your staff to be risk averse and can't make any decisions on their own and have to follow all kinds of policies and can't use their own judgment and things and expect them then to lead to the, that's how you treat them. You have to treat them with the same values. We used to do these two-day trainings about recovery-oriented supervision, how to help people with the uh, staff along the way. <laughs> Example of a training program. This is one of my favorite things, actually. This. So who do you hire for these jobs? You don't need to hire only professionals. We had two thirds were not professionals. We took people from college, whether you graduated or not, but you were interested in this. Two thirds of these people had lived experience as either a family member or their own mental illness or both. It was a six to eight week, it still is, I shouldn't say was. It's a six to eight week training program. You get didactics all day long um, and you get a placement within a, um, in a program that wants to help you mentor you, and they're going to they could they tend to provide jobs and hiring after that for the place. It's a way to provide staff to some place, so you get to see these interns and students coming through. It was supported by the county paid for. And, um, this is the money, so you got a little stipend for the people there because they tend to be poor. These people doing these jobs because this is entry level, low paid jobs. Go jump start. We went through twenty seven sessions since. 2007, like 90% of people graduated. And I, I don't have it here, but they, they came off the website. This came, they, their work placement was something like 75 or 80% got a job when they graduated in the first month or something like that. Last week, we hired and we started a model program, or no, we got a grant and we're hiring a social worker to be connected to the university police to go out on calls for the dorm for when kids are struggling. <laughs> they thought this is very innovative. <laughs> I did bite my tongue because I had told, suggested that same idea five years ago when I first got there. But all right, you guys are doing it. <laughs> so I'm meeting the, the, the new social worker. 
It's like I said, where'd you work before with kids and transitional age youth? And was that a, an act team or regular? And I says, says, I actually know you. I'm a Jumpstart graduate. There's Jumpstart graduates all over the place. How are you training and recruiting your people and what people? It doesn't have to be all professionally been, but it needs to be people who have, are abnormal in a certain special way that their heart goes out to people everybody is busy rejecting. But then you need to support them so they don't get traumatized and fall apart. You need to have a strong team and a strong emotional place for them to be working, not hidden by themselves until they're broken down doing this. In the same way that you're going to be bumped, you want the clients to bumble and learn as they go, you want your staff to bumble and learn as you go. It's not like I went to school and I learned everything I needed to do and don't need to learn anything more and I'm set to do the job and use the supervisor. I, I remember when I got my first job, the boss said, I, my policy is I hire good people and I leave them to do, get out of their way and remove obstacles so they can do what they want. I thought that was a great idea. Because I, of course, knew everything already. Just get out of my own idea. That is not what I needed coming out of the school was don't hire a group and leave me alone and see what I come what I come up with. Here's stages along the way of your career of goals of learning and you're growing and developing what you're developing to go through things. And as your supervisor or mentor, you can work on different things. What are your goals for this year? Once again, these aren't like, like you would put your goals, we put our goal for our job just as meaningless as the ones for like they put down on their pro on their treatment plan and we don't do those either. How about goals that are actually person centered for us and growth oriented and strengths based? Can I build, can I move forwards? What mentor can I find for you to connect to this? What extra set thing could I send you to that? What extra thing? So you can build. A terrific example of this is at the mental health center in Denver, the director there, he loves stats, so he's always doing things. But beyond that, every time he gets a new employee, and it's a big place, new employee, they come to the director's office and he says, I want to know who I just got here. I want to know what's special about you. What's your, give your special thing. What are we, what are you going to bring that no one else has got here? And what do you need developed so you can be the best person of you is supposed to be? That's, everyone gets that from the director when they come in and they follow up with what the plan is. How are you developing as a person? Six, how about making the community a better place so it actually in a, uh, tolerates people and doesn't throw them out and make spaces? So this is super hard. <laughs> and most of us don't even have any idea how to do this. I want to tell two stories, though, to go with this, please. Bro. Both inspiring from Europe. The first one is Giel Belgium. Giel Belgium, so in about 1200, there was like some minor king or nobility in Belgium, and his wife died, and he was terribly depressed and couldn't do any of his kingly functions and stuff and doing terribly and wanted to kill himself. And his advisors thought that the solution to this would be that he should marry his 15-year-old daughter because he she removed minor of his wife, and that would get him out of the depression. The 15-year-old daughter didn't seem to think this was such a good idea, so she runs away. All the king's horses and all the king's men go chasing her down around the kingdom, or the when she's running away, and they catch her and uh, kill her for being uh, disobedient. Daphne, that's the daughter's name, becomes the patron saint of mental illness. Why it isn't like the advisors of the king, I don't know. I didn't make up this story. Daphne is a patron saint of mental illness, and they make a sanctuary there and a center of healing. They have a place, this church, it's still there. And you get healed spiritually. You like do this kind of ritual and this prayer here, and then walk to this station and this kind of water and this kind of stuff and other things. And this has been there since the 1200s as a place for spiritual healing for mental illness. Saint uh, Daphne, you can see Daphne's picture up there. Now, two of the things I warned you about happens at, uh, to this place. One is, it appears that Daphne is not 100% successful at healing all mental illnesses that come by. <laughs> so in 
So there's some people left over with some symptoms who aren't cured hanging around. But she's successful enough, there's a magnet effect. <laughs> people start showing up from, you know, like Germany and France and Holland and, and the other countryside to get healed by Daphne because it may not be 100%, but it's a good service and it's welcoming and it's a sanctuary. And people, right? people come to this. And the town is left with this problem of all these like homeless, mentally ill people who show up to be healed by your center and aren't, and now they're wandering around. What do we do with this? It's amazing how problems, you know, what, this is 1200, this problem started. They come up with a truly unique so solution. They do adult foster care for all of them. This is a farming community in the Middle Ages. Everybody takes in somebody who's come, you know, so wants to stay around, and they take them in as part of their families. At the height of this, um, and went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. About half of all the families had someone with mental illness as part of the family. When the father died, they got, they got passed along with the sons. I'm sure some of them treated nicely, and some didn't, and some used them for you know, farm slave labor, and some were, they saw every birthday as part of the family, and that's what happened there for deal with known. Now, two things happened over hundreds of years of doing this in this community. One is, they stopped the stigma and fear of people with mental illness. They were around all the time. They were part of their family. They were present there. They were just not used to all these weird behaviors. And that's true even today. I was at Gio for a conference about adult foster care, and they were there. And I walked in a restaurant, and there was a person sitting in the restaurant talking to herself, jabbering, gesticulating. There was a, the next table was a family with someone in a high chair and a little kid, and it was, they weren't like freaking out or talking or that. So, the other thing that happened is the whole city got stigmatized because they tolerated people with mental illnesses. Half the people in Giel are crazy and the other half are half crazy for putting them. There. Now, this goes on very successfully on and off for the centuries until just recently, like the 70s or so. In the 70s, a couple things happen that make this start crumbling. It's barely there today. The, the, actually, it's barely there in 2000. I was there. I'm not sure it's there today. Two things happen. One is, this is no longer a farming community with families based on the manual labor sorts of things. This is like now a suburb of some other bigger city moving out, and the families are broken up. And it's like everything else. And there isn't the same kind of be part of the family and connection and roles. And the social fabric isn't the same in this town as it was for these hundreds of years. The other thing that happened was treatments came around. The professionals came into town and said, you know, this isn't really treatment. These people need to be taken to treatment facilities instead and be with professionals. They shouldn't just be with these families like this. They need to be in halfway houses. They need to be in hospitals. And they brought medicines with them. And then the tolerance went way down because of medicine. I shouldn't have to put up with this. Why don't you just take your medicine? behaviors for hundreds of years, it's like, no, we got medicine to stop to take your medicine so we don't have to put up with this. It's our right to not have to put up with this anymore. You need to take your medicine. And it's disintegrating. I tell this story of an example of the factors both in favor and against of what we're fighting against for of what a community could actually look like. Other story. Trieste, Italy. Now, Trieste is a strange place geographically. It's on the edge near Venice, where the Adriatic Sea comes up. And so it was at the edge between like the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, and it gets fought something back. It even switched which country it was in in World War I between them or something like this. So they're used to being on the outskirts, not the center of anything. Don't expect the central government down in Rome or in Vienna to do anything. We're on the edges over here. And they also are incredibly diverse. They've got people from all over the place there, you know, some Muslims, some Christians, some German, different languages, very diverse place. So they're used to kind of having a bunch of diversity of different people, and they got to make on their own the central government isn't going to do where we're at, is their history for the last hundred or so years. They also were really devoutly communist <laughs> in like the 1920s. That everybody should, to each according to his ability, from each according to need, everybody taken care of, a social network thing, everybody's taken care of. 
And there was a leader who was a psychiatrist who said, we are emptying all the psychiatric hospitals here. We're making community centers and everybody will take care of their neighbors so that everyone deserves it. No one, there's no wealth inequality. We'll take care of them and do it. So take care of them. And the thing works. They set up all these community centers. They, people all, they closed all their hospitals. People had places to live. The neighbors took care of them and everybody connected them and stuff. This became a, uh, what do you call it? One, one of those, uh, like a, a, one of these historical things of, of culture. The mental health system is the cultural thing here. Look what they did. I remember as a resident while looking at films, they're taking like in the 20s and 30s, these people doing this stuff. This one is still basically there today. A group from Hollywood went to Trieste to be inspired. And they, their cab driver said, oh yes, we have very good vets, our mental health clinic. We have very good mental health clinics here. They're staffed 24 hours a day. You can take people there, you can walk in, their crisis brought to them and taken care of. There's very little hospital, there's a teeny bit of hospitals. The community tolerates, they do hours and stuff. They've got this whole thing set up and it's been there for 80 years. It's currently at risk. They have a new right-wing government take over Trieste as a mayor and stuff, who says, I'm not tolerating all these people around here and all this communist shit. And they're gonna build some hospitals and stop the 24 hours, take too much staff to keep things open 24 hours and cut them down and they're busy tearing down a beloved community system that works, that everybody loves. This is creating outrage both in the city itself and through the entire world's psychiatric abuse to stop doing this and it's going to, it's a political battle that's ongoing right now. Once again though, this is an example of a community that by given really good support in the community with, this, with service and a place to take someone to and places to belong, the community took pride in that and rallied around it and supported it. Each community has its own strengths and weaknesses. It's real different trying to build this here and in Hollywood or in Trieste or Geo or these various places. What's, it, you notice both these threads start with this historical thing. It's what's your historical thing? What do you got here? Fishermen or loggers or people come or you know what? I don't know the stories of this stuff. What can you build on that the narrative can be? We are inclusive. We are welcoming. We have a narrative of our city. This is what it is. I saw one, for instance, by the way, back to my hospice example. It was Missoula, Montana, I believe, that the mayor started getting this big thing that he wanted it to be, Missoula is a good place to die. That if you're old, you're not going to be neglected and die alone. High school students stop by on the way home to check out what the old person is doing along the way and, and connect it along the way that everybody said, don't look at dying as a terrible thing. It's probably working. we're going to take care of people as so you're not scared. That's probably working. we're not going to neglect all people in the nursing homes like everybody else is doing. That became part of their pride of the thing. This is a civic one that requires lots of, let's see, what is the vision? I can't tell you what the vision is. I can give you some examples of places where one of the strengths for their vision. I do know that in order to be able to do this, people need not to be frightened. Do I have a slide of that or is that the last slide? I do left. People need not to be frightened. People need security. And that's where you guys, the police, come in and hear about how do you support people to feel secure while taking these chances, while having these places, to be able to uh, do this stuff, to build your community so we do this together. So like my local church has a thing that feeds people who are homeless and stuff comes up. But there's some aggression going on and some hang out because they stick around because there's a magnet effect. And then the Sunday schools come and some other people say, you know, there's people around for our kids. Why don't we stop doing that feeding thing anyway? I know Christ said people. Why don't we stop doing that feeding thing because our kids might be in danger? They need some help with security to keep doing it. We can be both. We can be a Sunday school and feeding thing in this church. It doesn't have to be they destroy everything. How can we negotiate? How can we keep it together? This one is one of the hardest pieces of the vision of how do you hold it together as a community. That's selling the system. Vision, finances, places, staff, community, integration. It is possible. Got a lot of pieces to 
helps a bit along with everyone's just going to look different. But you don't have to work for the uh, evil empire. You can build a uh, rebel base here. That's it. Thank you all.